Hey, what's up, Minnesota Moose? How's it going, Ixo? He's back. I know. I'm sorry. I know. Listen, it's flattering. I mean, if you're complaining about only getting me once a week, then I've got good problems, right? But I'll be drafting a bunch of Dominaria, as I promised publicly on Twitter. So I'm not promising the old schedule or anything, but I will be uh, firing off plenty of on-stream Dominaria drafts in a week. How are, how are y'all doing? How, how are you liking the formats? What are you drafting? Y'all playing uh, Cube? You playing Strixhaven? You playing uh, Modern Horizons 3? I think we're drafting War of the Spark tonight. And like, I mean, look, I didn't do a single practice draft, but I drafted War of the Spark the whole three months it was on Arena and everything. I played War of the Spark. I'm, you know, it was only, what, two years ago? I'm not that new. In fact, I'm the opposite of that. I'm extremely old. Um, so it was Cube last week. Um... They said I could pick and I picked Dom, but it actually hits Arena next like next week. So we're going to wait one more week on Dom and then do Dom. Uh, so this week we're doing War of the Spark. Yeah, of course. I mean, I would do Dom every week. Like, unless it was maybe like a brand new format. Like, if I were scheduling it, it would probably be like, you know, three weeks of most formats when they come out. And then, you know, nine weeks of Dominaria draft or whatever. Obviously, give or take, you know, like if it was like Strixhaven, I'd maybe only do one week of it. If it was like, you know, Zendikar Rising, I might do like six weeks of it. But ultimately, all paths lead to Dom. Thanks, Andy Mac. Yeah, that was epic. That was good fun. Felt like I ran like super hot in that semis and... It's kind of like the opposite of like what had been happening to me when I'd been losing like round one and two a lot. Like obviously I got lucky to win. That's magic. I ran hot. My opponents bricked when they needed to draw it like, you know, a removal spell. Like it was just like totally my day to run hot. But I also think my deck was kind of cool and sweet. Like when I asked how to draft cube and that was like my first time drafting that cube. I don't know if it was literally my first or my third or whatever. Um, but like people said like, you know, red, white or aggro, these colors do this. Nobody really said draft Mardu control. So that was kind of cool. But I also, like, started with, like, two Planeswalkers in the first three picks or something in those colors. So building around that was, you know, somewhat intuitive. I'm just finishing up a best of one, and then I will fire my uh, sweatsuit pod. I'll concede if, like, everybody's waiting on me or something, but I'll have to... I'll go check in a second. I don't think, like... We get off pretty quick usually, and it varies, but it's pretty rare that it's like 7.02 as opposed to like 7.10 or something. I agree. Uh, I've been playing it a little more today because the cube, I played a little bit, and it was fine, but then I was like, all right, I'm going to go back to Strix because I don't love either of these. But, uh, but yeah, like, I'm, I'm pretty over Strix, too. I'm looking forward to the next set. Like I said, the, you know, everything's always a combination of factors. Like, this is just, you know, good human, like, this is just good insight overall. Like, uh, people always think, like, X causes Y, but in reality, like, everything has a certain amount of value and the combination of everything causes everything or whatever. And so, like, you know, there's not, like, I didn't take a break because, like, a certain thing happened, but I was definitely feeling way less motivated by my lack of enjoyment for Strixhaven. You know, like, I just wasn't really enjoying draft after draft and talking about it because they're all the same. All the games are the same. The interactions with the cards are the same. Like, you just, like, it's not bad gameplay in Strixhaven. It just has, like, no re repeatability. Like, you just draft Quandrix the same way, Silvercoil the same way. Like, half your decks are one of two Quandrix or Silvercoil deck that are, you know, whatever. And then you can get a little creative. Sometimes Prismary's more aggressive, more controlling. Sometimes you splash, you usually splash in those controlling decks. Okay, cool. But, like, that's, like, the whole format. It's like, come on. Like, you can't build, uh, you can't, yeah, if you're going to do a guild format, there's just got to be more flexibility. You know what I mean? And lessons are colorless or one of two colors to cast. So, like, every deck's casting the same lessons. Like, I give them an A on this format for in-game play. Like, learn is a good in-game play mechanic. It leads to less flood, less screw, long games, decisions. But, like, there's, the diversity just isn't there. You know what I mean? The repeatability isn't there. Like, I enjoyed it at first. Like, if you check week one or week two, I wasn't trying to promote it. Like, obviously, I don't care how much Strixhaven people buy. I, like, enjoyed the format a lot week one and week two. But then by, like, week three or four, I was just kind of like, 
eh, like it's fine, but I'm kind of playing the same games that I've been playing week one or two, you know? So like, I don't know if like that was everybody else's experience. And I know there's some room to explore, like credit to Sam Black, you know, Demir's not broken or something, but it's not an obvious strategy and it's good. It can compete. Now, I don't believe you can put it together that often successfully, you know, but that's usually where I disagree with them. But when it's there, it's certainly a strategy worth knowing and it's creative and different. But that said, even then, how many of those are there? And like, you know, how many times are you in seats where you're seeing the, you know, the right blue cards through not a Quandrick player and the right black cards through not a Witherhaven or whatever wants the same black cards to you? Anyway, I, I'm digressing a little bit because we could probably do an hour deep dive on that. But my point is basically this format feels like you, you do not have a lot of different options and it does not feel like it has a lot of repeatability to me. But I actually genuinely think the in-game play is quite good. Like, I I enjoy it, like, right now, but then, like, two drafts from now when I'm playing, you know, Silver Quill versus Quandrix, and I'm the Silver Quill, and they're the Quandrix, and it's the same matchup or whatever, I'm, like, off it. Thank you, Wizard. Appreciate the subscription. Thank you for the support. Yeah, exactly. And you can't draft Lorehold, and you can't draft Witherhaven or Prismari as often as you can draft Quandrix and Silver Quill. They're just not as deep. They're competitive. Like, if you're, you know, if there's one Prismary, one Witherhaven, and, like, you know, two to three Quandrix and Silver Quills, I think all the decks are close enough. But you just can't, like, there can't be two and a half, like, Prismary and uh, Witherhavens in each pod, like, or the decks will just be horrendous. So, like, it's like a it's like a three-deck format, almost not a four-deck format, because so many of the decks basically have to be some form of Quandrix or Silver Quill. Like, obviously, you splash and stuff like that. If you have learned in environmental sciences, you have infinite sources, et cetera, et cetera, but... Four, six, nine. Wither Bloom, Wither Haven. I don't know. Silver Bloom. I thought the deal was me and Boxy are allowed to make up whatever words we want. I thought that was like part of the terms of our agreement being magic streamers. Thanks, S Code. Appreciate the subscription. Twenty is ready for me. Uh, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'll just pull it up. I mean, I assume they're gonna concede and or die in a turn or two. I mean, like I have look at the board, but obviously I wouldn't hold up like a tournament to eight people. But I assume it's gonna be ten seconds or whatever. Um, let me get in the queue. Um, where am I going? Sorry, the reason for the silence. I'm not even looking at the arena screen right now. I'm pulling up Haruka app and jumping in the draft queue so as not to hold up the sweatsuit over this best of one game. I'm fa failing at copying and pasting, which is really shocking if you know how good I am with technology. Copying and pasting is definitely something, you know, I need to practice. So the mic, yeah, so the thing is, the mic, my mic is great. I have a Blue Yeti mic that CFB sent me years ago that's really good. Um, the, the, the problem isn't really the mic so much as some sort of mic Discord Streamlabs interaction, and I'm not a tech guy. Uh, I did look into it a little bit over the weekend, but I don't really think I understood what I was looking at, and I think I'm going to have to hire, like, somebody or something. I don't know, or just get, like, some like somebody who understands tech to actually screen share with me or something and look at it. Because, like, I did honestly look into it, and I just, like, was like, I, I don't know what's going on here. I'm so bad with technology, it's, like, embarrassing. I promise you I'm 37, not 57. I promise. Oh, 
Oh yeah, I agree. Witherbloom is uh, totally fine when it comes together. Uh, the 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 pro the problem is uh, you know it's not really a deck, but okay. No, but uh, I mean, like I said, final thoughts on Strixhaven before we start this uh, war, the Spark Draft. Like I said, I think that Learn was a cool mechanic. I think that there should have been like maybe some uh, one uh, like there should have definitely been common like one color Learn cards. And I think this should not be a guild format, like with Learn. I'm not saying they can't do like school, strict save, and magic school format if they want. I think using, I, and I understand it's called Learn, but it doesn't have to be. Obviously, that's a, an app name for it. I get how all of that came together. I'm not saying any of it doesn't make sense. I'm saying what you need Learn in a much more diverse format so that like there's 10 color combinations and people are fight, figuring out how good the different Learn cards are in each of them. Like if there were four different red color pairs, then you can print a red Learn, a, like a red lesson at common. And then like there's four, and, and then it has different values in all four different red decks. The reason they didn't do it that way is because there would only be two red decks in a, in a guild format instead of four, like if you could play all 10 color combinations. So, um, you know, then they made them red or white so that they could go into like three of the color combinations or whatever, right? Um, but like, so basically what I'm saying is they need to like, like do learn by a different name and whatever in a format that you can play all 10 color combinations. And I think it would have been, I think it would have done much better had they done that. All right, anyways, let's get into the War Spark. That's my final thoughts on Strixhaven for tonight. We're drafting. We're trying to repeat. I don't know if anybody's done that. I think somebody's won more than once, but has anybody went back-to-back -back weeks? So we'll see if we can do it tonight. Finale of Eternity, I remember being totally broken. Might have been the best rare in the set, if I remember correctly. Uh, War of the Spark was a couple years ago. Like I said, I drafted it. It's three months or whatever. Not one of my favorite formats, but definitely I was familiar with it. I didn't like refresh this week, though. Destroy up to three creatures. Toughness X or less. If X is 10 or more, return all creatures. So this just kills like three creatures. You pay six mana and then kill three creatures that have uh, toughness four or less, right? It's not combined, right? Like if you pay six, you can kill three four fours. Am I, like I'm reading this correctly, right? Like, if you tap this for six, you can just kill three of their four fours? Or is it combined toughness X or less? It's good either way, but if it's three four fours, it's, like, the best card in the format. If it's, like, you know, if you pay six and you can, 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 build, can, can, can kill a combined four toughness of theirs, that's not, like, a bad card because, like, they may have, like, you know, a one toughness creature and a three toughness creature, like, and it's flexible. It's an X spell. If it's X or less and just kills three, that's just, like, the best card in the format. I don't even need to, like, see the whole format. So anyways, okay. It might have been number two or three. I'm Obviously, I don't remember every card. So anyways, okay. So we have a totally S-tier black mythic. We're going to try and draft black. Pretty bad. Um, Kaya looks good, of course. Uh, I don't think this card is, like, you know, broken. I mean, six mana, kill a creature. If it lives, kill another. But if it kills two, that's really good. So certainly this card is good. Uh, what else is in the pack? Devouring Hellion. I think Black Red does do like a token sack thing. Paradise Druid's probably a really good ramper since you always get one guaranteed use out of it. Just like Constructed. This is probably an easy Kaya. It's on color with a rest here, Broken Rare. It seems like the best card in the pack overall. Maybe pick one pack one. You could consider Paradise Druid. That's probably the second best card in the pack. And But like, I would probably take Kaya out of that pack. Pick one pack one. And we first picked Finale of Eternity. Okay, so at this point, we're only black. And we're gonna play black, basically. Because... We have, like, first pickable black on common and possible best card in the set. So, flying for strength vigilance. This thing seems really expensive. Crew four, eight mana. Yeah, unless there's ways to cheat this in a play, this is probably not a good card. Um, Moru, eh, if you put a counter on a put double, that's a pretty strong ability. And I think counters on was a synergy fit in this format, but I think it's more of green white than green black, though I'm sure there's pl some green black ways since there's plenty of green ways. Uh, Charity Extract is probably not good. Herald's, like, fine. Colossus? I remember liking Colossus Dismissal a lot, and I think I liked Blue-Black. And we already have, like, two, like, expensive cards that can basically be, like, finishers, even though literally they just kill creatures. The value you generate off, like, killing two creatures with Kaya or, like, three good creatures with Finale of Eternity should win you a lot of games. So we do kind of want to draft, like, defensively if we can and stuff like that. Uh, Callus Dismissal, not Colossus, obviously. Okay, Thanks for always, you know, keeping me honest, chat. Okay, so uh, Feather's probably busted in a white-red. I don't think we're going there. Like, like you know, if we play black-green or if we, even if we didn't play black, like maybe we could play a three-color deck with fixers, play white something, splash the black finale somehow or something. I don't know. But I doubt we're going to try and draft um, white-red. 
Harold looks fine. Charity and Finisher, probably more aggressive. Nothing really good in blue. Nothing really good in any other color that we can really use. Maybe the Sunblade Angel's better. But we do already have a six mana card. And Finale of Attorney is basically another six mana card. And I'm not saying like we can't play a third or anything like that. But this is three picks into the draft. So I'm pretty hesitant to take another six mana card unless it's like broken. And I think that card is probably good. But I don't think it's like broken or anything. Okay, so clearly no black cards in this pack. Uh, the blue cards are not very good. Uh, Prison Realm's excellent. I mean, it's removal scry one. Like, that's just a really good removal spell. Like, don't sleep on scry one. By the time you have enough ma uh, mana that, and and you want to kill play an unconditional removal spell, scry one, every time you put a land on the bottom, is almost draw a card a lot of that time. Or if you don't have land four, it's really good then. The green cards look fine, but we just did pass a good white six drop. And if we're seeing Prison Realm fifth, I'm going to assume white is way more open than green. Um... So, what does black-white do in this format? Because I do not remember drafting black-white a lot. Like, I remember white-green counters matter. I remember, like, blue-green proliferate. Red-blue spells matter, right? Like, Burning Prophet is, like, a pseudo-mythic common in the blue-red heavy spells deck. I don't really remember white-black. I mean, I guess at this point I'm going to draft just like I did in the cube almost. Because, I mean, we already have Kaya, Prison Realm, F Finale of Eternity. So, it feels like we can just draft a control deck. But I don't really know. Black White has mostly lost the game. I hope that means late game. Because if it's late game, that's what the cards I have are positioned well for. If it's losing the game, I'd prefer it wasn't that. Some life drain synergy. I mean, look, we don't have to go. We can certainly go black blue. I mean, we could always splash Prison Realm and who cares about Divine Arrow? Uh, I mean, this pack, eight is probably fine, especially if you have a Planeswalker, but you're not going to want a lot of it. It's pack one, but it's playable, I think. Spellkeeper Weird is good. That's like a nice blocker early. And then when a 1 4 blocker, I'm going to take Spellkeeper Weird. I'm going to talk about this a decent amount. Cards like this are way better than they look. If you're a defensive control deck, you'll love a 3 mana 1 4 on turn three, but you hate when you still have your 3 mana 1 4 in play on turn six. So a card like Spellkeeper Weird blocks well on turn three and four and you don't fall behind and then goes and gets back your removal your counter your card drawing in the late game when a one four is near irrelevant so cards like i know this was a good card i know nothing i'm saying here is profound I'm, I'm really trying to explain why for the people at home here who might not be as familiar with some of these control decks maybe draft a lot of aggro whatever or didn't play this format because it was i think like almost two years ago but my point is basically cards that perform block well early and help prolong the game and then provide power late perform really well in decks with really good late game because they kind of serve to win close games as a win condition and to prevent you from getting run over at the same time whereas cards like you know divination help you win but they also help you get run over like if your opponent has a good draw with an aggro deck they love it when you have a divination in your opening hand but if they have a good draw with an aggro deck they don't love it when you have a spellkeeper weird in your hand i'm not saying it's incredible to play a three minute one four but but it's serviceable Okay, rant over. So, contentious plan. So, it does seem like the white was a little bit of a fluke. It doesn't seem like we're seeing black, but again, we'll probably see black in pack two. I think we cut it off pretty well. So, I think the plan here is still blue-black control. Blue seems wide open. We just tabled two Spellkeeper weirds. And then, uh, so now we'll try and draft blue-black control. We'll look for fixers to splash realm. I doubt I'll toss three planes in prison realm in my deck, but... If I'm able to pick up, like, a free fix or a tri land or something, it doesn't take a lot to play a single white unconditional removal that's at its best in the late game. Um, I don't know. I'll assume I'm not going to need... Actually, this is best of three. If this was best of one, I would not take Charity Extractor. But if I play against a ground aggro deck, then I'll board in a 1-5 lifelink, and this is best of three. So, not best of one. So, I'm going to take that. I'm glad to see that feather wield because probably nobody playing white red and not putting together some kind of broken feather deck. This is in pod play, remember? I actually think the structure with 32 is kind of cool. It's just like you literally like basically win your pod playing in pod in the, you know against the same like card pool and then you get to advance to like the top four to see what the other like pods got produced and play against them. You know what I mean? It's like there's almost like two little mini championships. Like if I win my pod, I consider that like a win. And then if you win the actual finals, that's just like super sweet. Okay, so yeah, Swamp was a really nice late pickup. So Soul Diviner, I mean, this is a good card. Like, it's a 2-mana two 2-3. Two, it's a rare. It's clearly statted to be constructed playable, even though I don't think it saw much constructed play. But is it actually good, or is it actually just a serviceable 2? Remove a counter from an artifact creature, land, or planeswalker. Draw a card. So I guess it comes down to putting counters on things. 
We don't do that particular... Oh, a mass. Oh, okay. And we have Contentious Plan, Callous Dismissal, and a mass. This card is going to be very good in our deck. Um, it blocks well early, and it draws two cards a turn the whole game. Like, this seems... Like, don't get me wrong. Like, Spark Harvest and, like, Narset may be more powerful or whatever. But, like, this is getting a really good two-mana card. That's really hard to do for a blue-black control. I don't remember all the cards in this format. Lazatop, uh, the two-drop is pretty good, and that's one common. But it's generally pretty hard to get this kind of power level out of your two-drop, and not nearly as hard to get the kind of power level out of, like, you know, a Planeswalker or something. So I'm going to I'm gonna go with the Diviner. I'm not sure that pick is right. Spark Harvest might have been better. Narset might have been better. Haven't drafted this format in, like, over a year. But I'm confident that Soul Deniver will be really good in my deck. The reason being is a mass. I can just, and I'm good at amassing, right? I have Relentless, Herald, Callous Dismissal, Contentious Plan, and it's the start of pack two. And these Spellkeeper Weirds to get them back and replay them. And that, so like, I can just turn after turn draw two cards by just pulling one plus one plus one counter off my mass creatures, like turn after turn after turn. That just seems incredible, right? Um, okay, so this pack kind of not good for blue black at all. If we splash white, I don't know if I'd main deck to spark or not. It probably depends how much removal I get. I think to spark is the kind of card that, like, if you have, like, three, four removal, you play it. If you have, like, seven or eight, you don't. It would be off the splash. I'm just going to go with Contentious Plan. That's the kind of card that if one is good, like, multiples may be good. And if you get a couple early and you have some amass early, which we do, you can prioritize more and more of it. And then your deck can get really busted. Now, we can't control whether we're going to see more and more of the, you know, the mass cards. Like I said, I think there's that black one common. I forget its name. One, two, amass one. Like, that's a pretty nice card. So if we can get, like, a couple of those and these contentious plans and a couple of the uncommons and whatever, we may end up with a really busted deck. If not, I may just not even play the contentious plans. But when you get them early, you you can kind of sometimes put that together at pretty low cost. Okay, so No Escape is good. Key Aura is good if it's drawing cards, which it will not be. So it'll just be like minus one on tap of land in this deck for the most part. Seems mediocre at best. Um, so I think this is just No Escape, just a solid counter, right? This is the Planeswalker format. It hits creatures or Planeswalkers, so you don't really get like... It's not like it's... We're not playing Strixhaven here. They're not going to cast a lesson and make a creature. They're going to cast a creature or Planeswalker. You're going to counter it. Nice card. Okay, so this could be the fixer we need. No, it only adds mana for Planeswalkers. So it'll help us cast Kaya, but it won't help us cast Prison Realm. Like, it adds colorless for anything, but col whatever color mana you want, only for Planeswalkers, right? Okay, so that doesn't help us to cast Prison Realm. Guild Globe does, though. That's a nice cantrip fixer. Do we want that? So Wanderer Strike would be excellent removal to Splash, but we already have Prison Realm to Splash and no fixers yet. I'll certainly play a third Spellkeeper weird. I mean, we're not going to end up creature heavy. We're going to end up spell heavy. The Spellkeeper is going to be awesome. But we do already have two. So I think this is Wandering Striker Guild Globe. And I think I'm going to make the conservative pick and take the Guild Globe since I already have the Prison Realm to splash. And maybe even the Divine Arrow if my deck ends up that controlling. Whoa, do I splash Tamiyo? Is this Planeswalker good? It looks like something that would be good in a control deck. Um, so choosing non-land card, and with all these contentious plans and all this. Choose a non-land card. Yeah, I remember this from Constructed. This card's good. I don't think it's S tier, but I think it's like A tier. Like, I think it's like a good wing con planeswalker for a control deck. I don't think it's like broken. It doesn't kill creatures in, or protect itself incredibly well or anything. Um, yeah, I don't think it's worth splashing a Tamiyo instead of Prison Realm and missing out on Epiphany. Epiphany is just a great spell. I really want one to two copies of it because I have multiple Spellkeeper weirds. So if I draw my one Epiphany, I'll just, you know, keep weirding it back and just auto win with the card advantage in the late game. And, like, I do think Tamio might be better than Epiphany, but if I'm splashing Tamio and putting a Forest in my deck, I'm probably not also splashing Realm and putting a Plains in my deck. So I think that's a pretty clear Epiphany. Um, if I didn't have Prison Realm and I had the exact same deck, I think it would be much closer. Because then I could just be like, all right, I'll splash green, right? Um, all right, Interplanner Beacon would have been a good way to help cast uh, Tamio, though. I could take it in case nobody's blue-green, but probably some green player will splash it, even if they're not blue. Um... This pack doesn't really offer me much. I mean, there's a pretty bad two drop. Uh, totally lost. It doesn't seem like it'll be good in my deck. Um, yeah, I'm going to take the beacon only because I don't actually want any of these. Um, remember, this is the Planeswalker format. It's a lot more likely this will enable some kind of splash than, you know, it would in Strixhaven where there's, you know, three mythic Planeswalkers or whatever. But that said, uh, that's a bad pick. Like, not like my pick is wrong. Like, I'm really unhappy with that pick. Okay, so we can grab another Guild Globe. And uh, have another source for Realm. 
we can grab Price of Betrayal. This doesn't seem good. I mean, look, we might board this in if they have, like, counters creatures, but this has the potential to be dead in your hand a lot of the time. We can grab Third Weird. Again, I'll happily play Three Weirds, but I've seen, like, three of them this pack alone, and I think there aren't very many blue players in this pod, so I think we're going to table some of the Weirds. I'm not saying we'll table that Weird, because that was seventh pick, and so we would get it back, like, 15th, like, dead last or something, and there's basics in this format, so we probably literally can't table that Weird, but if my memory is still functional at this old age of mine, I think there was, like, two different Spellkeeper Weirds we passed this pack, pack two relatively early to the middle of the pack, and I don't think there's a lot of blue players in this pod. So I think we'll probably table at least one Spellkeeper Weird unless somebody's super high on them or those packs were terrible. I don't think these cards matter. I don't think there's any shot we'll really use any of them. But again, it's best of three. Maybe we'll board in Charity, Extractors. You never really know. What's up, Nate Fennelly? Yeah, I get the Betrayal's good versus a mass. Like, it's a decent cyborg card. I don't think you want to main deck it just because of a mass. What happens when it's a dead card and it's in your hand? I mean, if you have a couple ways to loot or something, then you can main it. So, similarly, uh, Shadow Fuge, I'm never maining, but maybe I board it in and control Mirrors. Relentless Advance, I mean, we're doing the Amass thing. Like, we have two contentious plans and Diviner, which is broken with it, and Spellkeeper Weirds. I don't know, like, but don't look at this like we have a million fours. I'm not even remotely planning to main deck these Charity Extractors, their sideboard. So, like, I have four four drops. Towards the end of pack two, fours, I'd probably, like, like to have three or whatever, but we're not, like, our four drop slot is not what it looks like. These Charity Extractors are sideboard cards at best. Uh, okay, we're not going to play these. So far, no good on those uh, Spellkeeper Weirds. Hopefully I can get one next pick. I mean, look, it's not a big deal. I already have two, but I would play like a third and a fourth. I think they're going to be excellent in the stack. Search your library for Planeswalkers cards. Well, I only have Kaya right now, but I'm not going to miss either of these filler playable black and blue cards. And if I get another two Planeswalkers in pack three, remember, lots of uncommon Planeswalkers is the Planeswalker set. This could be a really strong card drawing spell if it's searching for Kaya and another Planeswalker every time. So that's not a horrible pickup. There's one of those Spellkeeper weirds I wanted. Patting myself on the back a little bit right now. Pretty happy with that. Um, okay, whatever. We're not going to play Skulker. I don't think it's like an unplayable five. Our fours are just better than it for what our deck is doing. Like, we have enough synergies and stuff that, like, I'd rather just play, like, Relentless Advance, I think, than Skulker in this deck. Spell to get back, amass to amass, except diviner, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Not by a ton, but I think, you know, by enough that I just can't see myself using Skulker. Um, okay, so Fibble Fib, not great, but it's hard to get serviceable twos for a control deck. It comes out, it's a speed bump, and it draws a card immediately. So not unplayable. I would definitely main deck that card if I drafted it, but I don't think it's great. Davriel? Depends on how many aggro decks are on this format. This is one of those cards that seems great against other mid-range and control and unplayable against opposing aggro. Uh, Finisher, always a playable card. It's a 3-mana three 3-2. Three, it's not like it can't block, but it's obviously an aggressive card. That's where it's at its best. Um, Epiphany, excellent, but we are already quite good at card drawing in late game. I'll play two Epiphanies, but I think the second has substantially less value for me than the first. So I think this is either Davriel as like a weak main card that we board out against aggro and and uh, are really happy with against control or board in against control. Uh, Fibble, Thip, or Epiphany. I'm going to take Davriel here, and this is going to look weird. I might not even main deck this card, but I'd be pretty happy with either of those blue cards' ninth pick. And I think blue is being really underdrafted in my pod. So I'm going to take the black card because I think that will result in me getting back Fibble, Thip. If I take the Epiphany there, I don't think I'll get either Fibblethip or uh, the black card back because it's the only black playable in the pack, basically. So I'm taking the black card uh, because I think it will result in me tabling Fibblethip. Okay, so here we'll clearly take Epiphany. Nothing else is close, Not right? Oh, well, I do want a Gateway Plaza for the splash, but whatever, we'll probably table that. And uh, I think it's just Epiphany's too much better than it. Oh, yeah, plain white could totally be busted. I agree. Obviously, I'm not, you know, switching to green or whatever, but uh, we have two guild globes, too, so we're pretty good on that white splash. Play, like, one planes. And our white cards would be, what, Prison Realm, Divine Arrow, and Ignite the Beacon, possibly. So, when I'm deciding whether to main deck Davriel, that's really just going to depend on how many good aggro decks there are. Was, did this format have a lot of good aggro decks? I really just honestly don't remember. Because that's the kind of card, like I said, that card is just fantastic in control mirrors and, like, unplayable versus aggro. It's just going to swing wildly. So if this was, like, Strixhaven, that would just be a great card. There's, like, next to no aggro in Strixhaven. But if this was, like, you know, call time and, you know, the aggro decks were borderline constructed, I would not want to put Davriel in my main deck. 
Okay, so Easy Thunder Drake, I think. Blue, nothing else really for Blue Black Splash White, but it looks like a pretty good card in the stack. I know we don't have a ton of cheap spells, but we're going to have cards in hand. It'll grow. Fine card. Thank you, Andy Mac and Camo. Really appreciate the subscription. Thank you for supporting the stream. Thank you for saying good luck. Yeah, Aid the Fallen would be nice and fasted. You know what I'm hoping for. All right, so let's see. Up next is Cruelty. is really good, solid instant removal. I started not drafting removal that aggressively because, like, I have, like, some, and then I didn't really get much more. So I think this is a good opportunity to pick up that. It's really important with three Spellkeeper Weirds and two Tamiyo's Epiphany that I have, like, one to two of every type of effect that I, that I want per game because my deck is going to see a ton of cards and can recur cards. So if I have access to something like Cruelty in my whole deck, I'm going to have it in, like, half the games because I'm, like, double Epiphany card drawing deck, and then I can recur it and play it multiple times. So what I'm trying to say here is this is similar to Learning Lessons where, like, the first copy of a lesson in your sideboard is worth a lot more than the second copy of the same lesson, even if it's a good one. It's the same concept in your main deck with spells uh, because, listen, you'll draw multiple copies of Omnixus Cruelty, you're ecstatic. I'm not saying draft the second Omnixus Cruelty lower like than you would normally draft it, but I'm saying the first copy is like getting that first lesson, like the first of a good lesson. I'm saying like, the because I'm going to see it in half my games and then recur it and play it multiple times when I see it. So it has way more value than if I was an aggro deck and I was going to see it like a third of my games and never cast it twice when I, when I draw it. So what I'm saying is like, if you have like a deck that's going to recur instants and sorceries and sees a lot of cards, the first copy of each functions like the first lesson in your sideboard. This looks like a pretty easy toll. Even if there's aggro, it at least leaves a body behind and we're doing the amass thing. So this, this should be sweet. I don't think it's like some amazing card or anything. I completely disagree. It's the best common in war, but I, I do think uh, we're happy to get it. I would have rather had a like the Lazatop Reaver or whatever that thing's called that I keep mentioning. I don't expect to see one. I don't think black is open, for the record. I think the people passing to me, who's passing to me in this draft? Joe the Magician and G cards? At least one of the two of them is probably playing black. Um, like, I believe in my seat, I'm supposed to be blue and probably like green or red. But I didn't see strong green or red. And, but, you know, you know I'll come off like even like a first pick Spark Harvest, Kaya, whatever. I don't get attached to first picks like that. But when I go pick one, pack one, possibly the best card in the format, and then second pick Kaya, all right. Like, I'll just draft black as a secondary color and focus on my, you know, main color if black's a little cut off, right? Um, okay, so... What do we have here? Prismite could be a fixer. It's pretty bad, but we might need a two drop. So it's, this is pack three. So Guild Globe lets you use your mana proactively on turn two. So that you can spend your mana. So that's three. But stuff like Arrow, Twist, even if we play them, don't count. Plan would do nothing. So we got like three two drops. Yeah, and, we, and we're probably going to light white splash. I'm going to grab a Prismite. I might play it. I might not, depending on whether we pick up one to two more two drops the rest of this pack. But the nice thing about this pick is it means I don't have to prioritize the two drops that highly. So if there's a good four drop or something and a bad two drop, now that I have this Prismite to be, to be my bad two drop, I can take the good four drop. Hey, let's see if anybody remembers, but we have a command in our stream. There were some people I disagreed with on some picks in War of the Spark, and Lazatob Plating was one of them, I remember. For anybody wanting to see any more of them, feel free to check out Gyre, uh, what was it called? Gyre Engineer? Um, Alright, so Vito, no shot I'll main it, but I might board it in in the right matchup if we splash white, so that's not a horrible pickup. Uh, it looks like I have about enough playables, so I don't think I'm worried about too much. The curve actually looks good. All these three drops are, like I said, they don't get better or worse, particularly in multiples, just fine. Like, I'll play all four for my three drops. Two drops, three drops, four mana cards, finishers. This looks to be fine. I don't think my power level is like through the roof or anything, but I think like I have late game, I have some removal, I have a busted card, like a totally busted card, and I can definitely grind. I can recur things, I've got, I can attack the hand, I can draw cards, I can kill creatures, I can counter things, and then I can recur all that good stuff. So, I mean, this deck certainly has vulnerabilities, but it can definitely grind and win games. Yeah, I can see two drops being super important because you have to be able to defend your cheap planeswalkers and attack theirs. I mean, I only have Davriel. Uh, if somebody has a Narset or a Davriel against me, I definitely want to be able to attack it. 
I mean, this isn't constructed, like, I can epiphany on their turn, and then that's all the card drawing. Narset's it's really shutting off, right? Oh, no, I can't. It shuts off the globes, too. So that, yeah, I do need to be able to remove Narset or something like that. Uh, I don't think Totally Lost is good in my deck. I mean, I could play it because it's a spell and all of that, but I don't think it's going to make my deck. I mean, it's a think of cards like Totally Lost more like time warps than removal. Like, obviously, it's neither of those things. Like, you know, it can function in combat as a bounce spell, kind of, like to blow out a trick or double. Like it, it, But, like, I would think of cards like that when I'm valuing them, like during the draft portion, more as when I'm trying to assess how good they're going to be in my deck, more as time warp than a removal spell. If you have like, you know, an aggressive deck that's going to want to like keep attacking and then slam a time warp on turn five because your opponent's going to have a better late game than you, time warp's really good. I'm not saying I wouldn't play time warp in my deck. Obviously I would. But if you're going to be behind and then you're going to warp, it's not necessarily much better than a five mana explore, right? Whereas like if you're ahead, it's it replaces itself by drawing card, lets you make that land drop, but it also gives you that extra attack. So, like, if you are if you deal them four and then you time warp, most likely you're dealing them four again next turn, right? And it replaced itself, and you just cast something else. You untapped your mana that you spent for time warps, so and now you use that same mana on something else. So it ends up being, like, five mana, deal four, explore. In my deck, it's just going to be five mana, explore, a lot of the time. Obviously, you can do more than that. Obviously, I'm going to be ahead sometimes. Don't get technical. But I'm just saying from like a broad, generic standpoint, if you want to know how good like a tempo card is in your deck, think about like the further ahead you're going to be on average over the early turns, the better it is, like the more aggressive you are really. And like the worse, uh, the better your late game, the less good it's going to be. Just compared to how good it can be. Obviously, those cards get very greatly. Okay, anyways, let's build this deck. Um, yes, zero mana explorer. You can't cast until turn five, Ferex. You're right. And and I touched on that. I said you get to untap the mana and cast something else. But yes, uh, when I call it an explorer, it's a zero mana explorer. You can't cast until turn five. That is, that, that precision is more accurate, yes. Okay, so let's build this deck. So first, let's cut the stuff. Of course, we're literally not casting. Uh, and stuff like Shadowfuge. I mean, this is a sideboard card, but... It's not going in my main. Um, but almost all of these cards have a reasonable, like, chance to go in my deck, right? Like, we could play almost all of these. Like I said, the Charity Extractors, fine blockers if all your opponent's trying to do is attack on the ground. But if I play some other mid-range mirror or control deck and I have that card in my deck, I'm not going to be happy. All right, so, obviously, Defiant Strike I just missed. So this is one... How many cards here? I think it tells you somewhere. 35. Just get rid of the lands to make my life easier. Um, okay, so, so 31. This looks like it'll probably be a 17. Now, nah, maybe we can go to 16. I know we're in control deck, but we actually have one 6-mana card and two Epiphanies and two Guild Globes. So, and we're, if we splash white, we'll play all the Guild Globes. Like, if we play, like, a two-color blue-black deck, I might play 17. But with Wall of Runes and two Guild Globes, because then I won't play the Guild Globes, but with two Guild Globes and Wall of Runes in my deck, two Epiphanies and this curve, I think we play 16, even though we're, like, a defensive deck. Thank you, Real Nequium. Really appreciate the subscription. Thank you, Logic897. I think I've said this before, but 22 months of support. Very smart. I love both your reasoning skills and, like, you, you know, the ability to Logic and your rap. Keep doing what you're doing, Logic897. Appreciate your con contributions to the world. If anybody else subscribed when I was building my deck or going nuts, thank you. Really do appreciate the support. Um... Share the screen in Discord. Oh, everybody's just doing that now. Ah, oh, yuck. Well, hopefully if it's not a voice call, then it won't do the mic thing. Um, okay, I'll try. Let me go in there. I'll go in there after this. Okay, so uh, this is 31, so we need to cut, like, if we're going to play 16, which we are if we splash white and have double Guild Globe in our deck along with Wall of Runes, then we need 24, so we have to cut seven more cards. Oh, I mean, Ignite's getting cut. Like, if I had three, I would play Ignite if I wanted to. Like, if I wanted a five-mana draw spell. Um, but we have two Epiphanies, and we only have two Planeswalkers, which means, like, we're going to draw one of the two a lot of the time, and then Ignite's only going to search for one. I mean, it's just an easy cut. Um, okay. That doesn't search for creatures, too, or anything, right? Just Planeswalkers? Yeah. So even with three, you wouldn't draw two of three very often. But with two, you draw one of two very often, and that's just a bad card. 
Um, okay, Divine Arrow, not good off a Light Splash. If we were going to have more white sources, sure, but we're probably going to play one Planes or something. We have, what, two white cards, one white card? We really didn't get many white cards. So if we have enough playables, maybe I won't splash white at all. I mean, Realm is a fantastic card, but is it worth putting two Guild Globes in my deck? They don't really do anything synergistically for me other than fix. I don't really need the fixing if I play a two-color deck here. Um, I'll probably board in the white when I want Veto or something, because Veto Realm might be really good in some matchups. But if the only white card I was going to play is Realm, and I really, like, Globe is kind of a free source, but not really, because I have to put it in my deck. It's not that I mind the two-mana draw card so much, it's that I have to, like, cut other cards and play it. So I'm just going to cut these Globes, cut this Realm. So that puts us to 26. So now let's see. I, I would consider 17 more for blue-black. Oh, but we have all this two-mana card drawing. I was thinking with the globes out, we, we wouldn't have the ability to draw a card on turn two in our two-mana hands, but we have two contentious plans, and I want to play those. It's a lot of a mess. So, okay. And then Prismite can get out, obviously. Um, so, yeah, this is this is looking good. Now we only got to cut, like, one card. Yeah, Prismite out, too. You're 100% right. Um, yep. I honestly didn't see the chat. I just got there. But yeah, um, you got, you're 100% right, Old Red and uh, Hatless Jester. Yeah, Prismite is an easy cut there. We looks like It looks like we have a ton of two-mana cards. Like, this is not a two-mana card. Like, for the purpose of Curve, like, let's see. This is not a two-mana card. Like, I'm never playing those on turn two. Yeah, we don't really have a lot. We have the right amount, basically. We have four that are like we're happy to spend our mana on, and two we can cycle if we need to hit a land drop or something. So never mind. We're not these. I forgot we had all these pseudo two mana cards, so we're not cutting any of the like two mana cards we can actually cast here. And I know call, wall cost one, but we can cast by turn two to not get run over. So anyways, those are basically not cuttable. So what are our cuttables here? We could cut Davriel. Those are basically not cuttable. We could cut Relentless Advance, Thunder Drake. Those are probably the worst of the two fours. Uh, Thunder Drake broken in blue red spells, but. You know, and we're probably going to play it, but we're not, like, an aggro deck, and we don't double spell. Uh, Time Twist is cuttable. Not a great card. Uh, exiling, uh, like, Kaya's amazing, but exiling, like, your mass tokens doesn't work. Um, no, I don't think we want to trim a weird. Uh, it, I don't think it really gets better or worse in multiples. So, like, we could cut a weird if we had, like, enough better three drops, but we literally have four three drop creatures. That's not, like, a ton. And we don't even have a ton of two drops, so we definitely want to draw, like, a three drop every game. So I wouldn't even consider cutting a wheel, oh, a weird. And even though these are three drops that you don't really fall behind, you don't really want to, like, Omnix's Cruelty their three drop. You'd rather play a weird on turn three and have Cruelty to kill their five drop. Same thing with No Escape, basically. Toll, I'd be pretty happy to proactively play on turn three anytime. So I would view Toll as, like, a three drop, because, like, you know... Unless they, like, are on the play with an aggro deck and go 2-drop, 3-drop or something. Like, this is a proactive 3-drop that's basically going to be at its best around turn 3. Because, like, you can't cast it before that, obviously. But even discard that costs 1, like Thoughtseize. Here's a little bit of attack. A little bit of pro attack. Uh, this is more for Constructed, but the concept applies in Limited. People pretty much, like, who are, like, medium Magic players always Thoughtseize turn 1 if they don't have anything else to play. But a lot, almost all the pros I know who are good with Jund and stuff like that, sometimes Thoughtseize turn one, depending on the matchup. Sometimes they just don't on turn one, even if they had an untap Swamp as the only thing to play, and they play it on, like, turn three. Because you want to give your opponent time to draw, like, their best cards, the cards you're really hit, hoping to hit with Thoughtseize. So if it's a matchup where, like, they have Death Rite or something, and it's like, that's, like, an amazing one drop, you're going to do it turn one if you don't have anything else to do. But if, the, if you really don't care about their one-mana cards, and, like, you're really mostly interested in their three-mana plus cards, maybe wait till turn three if you don't if you have don't have a good three drop that you care about playing on turn three. Anyways, point is, discard at its best, basically, like, turn three or four, when, like, you have the max chance at getting their best cards, but they haven't emptied their hand ever. Um, I'm like all concepts all the time tonight because I really don't remember War of the Spark that well. So I can't go into like great detail about the archetypes on War of the Spark or anything, as you can probably tell, because I'm keep as I keep asking the chat, but Hey, the concepts that don't come up that often in Strixhaven and I haven't thought about and talked about for a little while that are coming up in War. I mean, that's kind of interesting. Okay. Anyway, so no escapes, not cuttable. Cruelty's not cuttable. Bolkai is obviously not cuttable. So these are basically our cuttables. So is Relentless Advance or Thunder Drake better as a 4-drop in our deck? Um, let's see. Relentless Advance, I mean, we can get it back with Weird, but that's just turning 1-4 and 0-3-3. That's, like, not great, not horrible. What else? Does it trigger? Like, what are the synergies? 
more amass synergy is good with it right like because it's like you're giving haste like you amass two with a three three out and suddenly you amass three with a two two out and suddenly you're attacking for five right so if you have like cheap amass that's good synergy with it so we have two well we have two plans which is good synergy with it plus one plus one draw a card plus hopefully on at least one other thing plating which is good synergy with it we can go plating on tap play that like Dis dismissal is good synergy with it bounce their thing get the one one then a mass then relentless advance attack for four um yeah that's a pretty good amount toll leaves a one one T toll them then relentless attack for four i think relentless advance is better in this deck than thunder drake thunder drake's probably gonna make it two so i asked this question and i didn't really see the answer uh is there a lot of aggro in this format because if there is davriel's not a main deck card like i i don't have like a ton of great one mana two mana cheap defensive cards or anything i have like enough but like so, I mean, if there's if people are gonna curve out two drop three drop on the play against me with aggro decks, I don't want Davriel in my hand. I could always board it in. But if there's like no aggro in the format, then Davriel's like a great card. So should I main Davriel or should that be a sideboard card? I think all three of the cards I have as the last cut are fine cards. I think the Drake is a fine card. Near busted and, and oh, you know what? The Drake works so well with the contentious plan. Play a spell, play the plan. Uh, I mean gets a counter the plan resolves grow it again yeah we're not cutting the drake with double contentious plan so i think it comes down to davriel or time twist here i think it's really just about evaluating davriel i mean i think we know what we're getting with time twist right super medium solid playable in our deck obviously dodge removal if we blink kai it's awesome just a medium overall card so it's really a question of how good davriel is Oh yeah, Toll's a good card. I don't believe it's anywhere near the best common set, but I believe it's a good card. I'm not anti-Toll or something. I'm anti-Toll's on the highway, not in War of the Spark Draft. Davriel, yeah, I know Davriel would be better for the grind. I know Time Twist is going to be more consistent. Uh, I'm saying like, you know, how many, what percent of my opponents am I going to regret having Davriel in my main against? If you had to like guess a number, I know you don't know, but like, you know, if you could just play against anything in War of the Spark, obviously if you're watching any other stream, never weigh in on any of these questions, please. But if you're only watching my stream, then I'll take help from my chat anytime. And uh, let's hypothetically say you were playing against just any random War of the Spark deck, you know, submitted like randomly from all War of the Spark decks. What per draft decks? What percentage of the time would your opponent would you regret having Davriel in your main? That your opponent would be like a, like a consistent aggro deck. It doesn't have to be like Kaldheim Boros level. Like red black level in this format, probably aggressive enough that I'm going to regret having Davriel in my deck. Fifteen. No, Wall of Runes is not getting cut. I would play a second Wall of Runes for sure. Um, if I had a second Wall of Runes, that would make me more inclined to play Davriel because I know I can block early and defend it better. So I might cut Twist and like, you know, something else. It probably, probably Relentless Advance or something. It, it probably wouldn't be Thunder Drake once I saw I had the, that's just too good with the Contentious Plan. You play something in plan, that's the second spell, it puts a counter on it, and then the plan resolves. You draw a card and put another counter on it. You've got a 4-5 Flyer. And like, plan basically did that and drew a card. That's like, I didn't, I forgot about the two plans, but I, but I would play a second wall of runes over either twist. And like, I would play a second wall of runes over Davriel, but I would probably just play Davriel too. If I could block that well early and just cut something else, probably relentless advance. Yeah. Time twist is aggressively medium. I agree. Which is why the question is when, when is Davriel going to be like horrible? Cause like, like I said, if your opponent goes two drop, three drop on the play, this is a horrendous card. But if you play like a bunch of mid-range grindy control mirrors, this is a fantastic card. So how often is Davriel going to be unplayable? That's the big question here. I'm seeing pretty low numbers. It looks like my chat's saying 15, 10 to 20, 20. All right, so that's good enough for Davriel over Twist, I think. If you said like 40, 33, I might bench the Davriel. Because remember, it's not a, we're not looking at the number 50 here. It's like, you know, you don't want to have a card that's going to be awful in one third of the one third of the time you draw it, like near on playable one third of the time you draw it. But if it's only gonna be 10, 15, maybe 20, all right, over over the aggressively medium twist I'm in. And then let's see, the lands are gonna have to be pretty close to even, of course. Um, triple black. Like we would go nine blue, seven black if we didn't have like triple black and double black, but even with this much more blue, it's still just gonna be like eight, eight, I think. 
maybe 9-7 because the two contentious plans and the Wall of Runes. But I mean, I need to draw a lot of black mana. Maybe I do want those Guild Globes. I don't know what I'd possibly cut for them. The only cards I have that are bad are my two drops, like Operative and Visionary, really. Um, eh, what are you going to do? Oops. I don't want any planes for Kaya. So the debate here is... I don't want to stick a bunch of bad globes in my deck. Um, Contentious Plan is like Cycle on turn two, but like globe. But in the late game, it could be a really powerful card in this deck. So we're going to either play 8-8 eight, eight or 9-7. It's pretty close. I think it's 8-8. Eight, eight. No, we have a lot of early blockers that are blue and card drawing that's blue. Maybe it's 9-7. I really want 9-8. Maybe I have to cut another spell. This deck really doesn't need 17, like, mana, but I think it needs the 17 colored sources. I'm not really comfortable with going to 7 black when I have a triple black card and a double black, like, best card in my deck. And I'm not really comfortable with going to 8 blue when my deck is, like, three two-thirds to three-quarters blue. Almost all my 2 and 3 mana cards are blue. So I think we're going to have to play 17 lands just to get enough colored mana sources. Wish I had, like, one blue-black duel or something. No, no, stop suggesting cutting wall. Globe could come in to help this problem instead of a land, sure. And that might be correct. But, like, wall is not cuttable. Like, wall is, like, in this particular deck, just, like, not in the aggregate, obviously. There are tons of decks wall is laughably bad in. But in this particular deck, I would say wall is, like, around, like, my 16th, 17th best card. Like, I'm not going to get crazy and be like, oh, wall's amazing. But, like, you know, it would be not even close to being cut. Like, I would cut, like, Herald, Relentless Advance, Relentless Advance, Thunder Drake. I would cut Davriel. I would cut um, maybe the Force Spellkeeper Weird just because I have a lot more things I can do by turn three than turn one. I wouldn't cut, like, like all four Spellkeeper Weirds before I would keep cut the first wall, but I would probably cut the fourth Weird, maybe the third. Like, there's a lot of cards I would cut before Wall of Runes out of this deck. I'm not going to play 41. That's just being silly. We'll just make the hard cut. The only time you play 41 is if you have like, or more than 40, is if you could see yourself going through your whole deck. Not because the last cut is hard. We want to maximize the chances of a strong finale of Eternity. Globe is good at casting Kai. Yeah, no, Globe could be right over the 17th land. That's true. We could certainly play 8-8 eight, eight in Globe or 9-7 in Globe or something. Probably 8-8 eight, eight in Globe. I'm not sure that that's going to be better or worse. Um... I mean, Globe has no synergy in her deck, aside from that fixing, right? Like, literally, it just, like, offers us nothing. We're paying two mana just for that fixing. Think I'm just going to cut Davriel, too. I was already on the fence about Davriel. I'm just going to play 9-8, I think. Obviously, it might get a lot different after board when I can board in planes, if Dovin's Veto looks really good in the matchup, and I also have a Prison Realm. But uh, And I might board in the Globe or whatever then, too, but... For now, I think this is the main deck version. It's just the consistent 9-8 blue-black. I'm comfortable with 8-black, not comfortable with 7-black. I'm comfortable with 9-blue, don't need 10, not comfortable with 8. This just looks like the right list. that is true six rock uh i mean not that like because the costs are different so it's not really you're right logically that like go globe drawing a card shrinking your deck by one when you have broken cards like cheap cantrips become better i've talked about this from time to time the difference though is like you're paying a cost when you play globe two mana to shrink your deck by that card and you get the fixing you could just not play 41. Like, if you had, like... If they ever make a mechanic, like, for every card in your deck... For every card your deck started above starting the minimum... The minimum starting deck size in your format, get X. Then we could start talking about 41, 42, because we're not disrupting the deck that much, but we'll get this, like, small bonus or whatever. Or, like... But, like, you know, like... There's no cost to go from 41 to 40. You just get to do it. <laughs> like, whether you play Globe or not is a cost. <laughs> but the point is solid. The Six Rock is making is the, the point is solid. That cheap cantrips do get better when you have broken cards. Um, okay, let me see if I've got an opponent. 
Uh, let's see. Looks like this week. Round one, we've got GG cards. And then if we win, we get the winner of Kanata Live, who's beaten me twice, including in the finals. I've got like one first, one second in this thing. Uh, or Icky. Cool. So let's go grab GG cards information and hopefully repeat last week. What did I pronounce wrong? Wait, that's not it. That's strict salmon. Oh, I probably didn't even add it. Hmm. Never really had the import fail before. Let me go check out what's going on. Wonder what's causing the problem. really sure what I can do about it because even if it's one card can I like kick it out of my pool I guess probably first I'm just going to try doing it again but let's see oh makes sense I did nothing differently I literally just clicked export again and then import okay um so let's make sure it's right but we already built it so we should be able to get started 9-8, blah, blah, blah. Cyborg's got plenty of planes because I definitely might board in the white some matches. I'm not really worried about other basics. I don't think we're going to board in red or green. Yep. So we're good. All right. Did I make any changes? I hope not. Did I accidentally click a card on the sideboard? No, there's Davriel, the most important card on the board. Time twist. All those extractors. All right, looks fine to me. I don't know. Looks like we're underway. The screen means we're connected and it's loading. Um, so let's do it. I could draw, but in the dark I should probably still play. I have a lot of card drawing. Looks good to me. Oh, yeah, you're right, swimming. Nice catch. You're 100% right. That's what I did. So, do we want this? Not a great card. We can loot it away probably i mean the re this card is good if you um really good if you amass before turn four so in this hand we already have a four drop and we don't have any mass so it's super medium um i really want a three drop i mean i'm kind of worried about getting flooded but i have two epiphanies and eh, i think i'm just gonna bottom it like i'm not gonna get run over when i'm on the play with wall of runes and visionary turn two so what i'm really looking to draw are my tamio's epiphanies like my finale I mean, that card is like a spell, which is better than a land, and a lot of my deck is land. But I also have the ability to loot the lands away, so that'll help prevent Flood in, if it gets dangerous. I'm not going to do any draft after this tonight. I mean, I might finish that best of one or something, but, like, depending on how long this goes. But even if I lose round one, uh, I'm not going to be doing it on a new draft tonight. But I officially promise, and I don't promise often, there will be a lot of Dom streaming. No, I'm not saying anything crazy, but, you know, like, a decent amount of hours. Like, there will be Dom streams. Um, okay, so we're definitely going to kill that. That seems better. 
the looting. We don't even really know if we want to loot lands away yet or not. I probably should have attacked with Erratic Visionary there. They probably wouldn't block because Verasca's finishers in the format. It wasn't intuitive to me to bluff because I'm not an aggro deck, but obviously I have the wall to block the Martyr, and I think they're highly unlikely to block, and obviously it's a free roll anyway, so I'm just pointing that out. All right, so five land lets us loot and no escape. We already have a land to loot, loot away. It's not like there's any way, um, you know, we're going to, like, be unhappy if we discard this island. Like, we need a black land, black mana to cast Kaya anyway, and um, it's uh, can't be blocked, right? Yeah. And uh, so, like, we can't cast Kai if we draw right now. We have to draw Swamp. Okay, so I'm probably going to no-escape that, but we might as well loot in response. I don't really know what we have that would change our mind, but I don't really think we're giving anything away here. It's more mana, I guess, for the Scry 1 anyway. I mean, more information for the Scry 1 anyway. So, obviously, easy loot away the island, easy bottom the island. Let's find those broken cards. Okay, so now, do we Visionary Main Phase? I think so. It can't block the wolf. I'd rather loot than attack with it, and we might get something we want to cast. Oh, just super flood. Where's my where's where's my relentless advance? Bottoming that might not have been the best choice ever. Um, all right, six is probably where we'll stop, but that doesn't mean we want to play land six. Um, we already have this island to loot away next turn though, but we can always play this after looting. If we draw another land, our hand's just going to be two lands. So I think this is where we stop playing lands for now. Oh, but what if we draw Epiphany? Then I might Epiphany and play an additional land and cast a spell. And that could matter a lot with Thunder Drake. So I'm going to play the Swamp because of the two Tamiyo's Epiphanies. So I hope... Every, like, let me go into that reasoning a little more now. It's my opponent's turn. So, look, there's not a ton of value at stake whether I play or hold that land. But it does matter. I'm not doing it because, like, obviously they're not black and they're not going to make me discard or something. It's because uh, Visionary. So, like, if I loot this in, if I draw a spell and loot this into a spell and then draw a spell the following turn, I won't be able to loot as profitably. I mean, I'll still loot because I'm not worried about decking if I have spare mana, but I won't be able to loot as profitably as if I had a land in hand. So I was thinking about holding two lands. What, what convinced me out of it was that I have two Tamiyo's Epiphanies. Card drawing makes you really not want to hold more than one land and even any land sometimes because we're like, if you're holding only one land or, and you draw a land, you could always play a land. So, like, you really can't get punished. But imagine you're holding one land, you draw four mana, draw two, scry two. So you play your land, you play draw two, scry two. You could get a land, or you scry like one land to the bottom and top one good spell. Then you draw a land in the spell. Now you can't play that land this turn. Imagine you're one mana short of casting that spell. So it's fine to always hold one land if like you don't have card drawing. Generally, I mean, there, can, there can be other exceptions. But if you have like good card drawing, you shouldn't necessarily even hold one land. In this case, obviously, I'm going to because of looting, but um, theoretically, if you didn't. Okay, so let's go ahead and visionary. I don't see this blocking. I think we've reached the point where we're going to have to block with Thunder Drake probably. I mean, it might, actually might not because I guess Harold blocks Arlen's Wolf and then I'm taking seven or chumping with Wall of Runes. But eh, they might have removal or something. If they have, I mean, I don't know. I, pro I maybe could have attacked with Thunder Drake because I don't think it's blocking profitably. But I also don't like think that two damage is super relevant at this point. We're clearly the control deck now. And while it looks like we're on our back foot and we're losing, and look, we are on board, if my library will stop uh, hating me, we're almost halfway through our deck. We have two Tamiyo's Epiphanies, Black Finale, Kaya, so if my library would start cooperating, I think this game is far from over, but if it's going to give me land after land after land here until I'm dead, then the game is going to be over. Yes, uh, at Kepitri, but the cards all weigh on each other, and I'm just explaining why. I mean, you know, it's like, if you tell somebody a concept, and they understand what you say, but they don't really understand why, I don't think they're going to apply it nearly as well. So I'm just trying to, like, elaborate a little on where the value comes from and why things are. I mean, if you follow my content, like, I am not even remotely trying to be concise. My main goal is to teach everyone how to think about magic, not teach people, like, what's right right now. So that, that's just generally what I go for. Okay, so what are we going to do here? What are my choices? I mean, look, I can take a hit. I'm not like that worried they're going to burn me for seven. If they have it, they have it. Three, four, and three, four, fine, whatever. I could, like, double block the worm. I would lose the three, two, and the three, four. But I only take three down to 11. I have to deal with a three, four flyer then. But I kind of like the amass two happening since I have the diviner. 
I, I think that actually might just be the right play. Keep the life total up. I get the 2-2 zombie. If they have a trick here, like, I'm not happy. But it's really not that big of a deal. I get the, like, it's not good. But it's something I was going to have to work through from this position anyway. And it's not like a particular blowout. So I think I like this block. Hopefully they don't have anything. But again, if they do, I could probably live with it. If it, like, exiles Herald or something. Like, if they magma sprayed Herald, I would be extremely unhappy. But yeah, like, something like that I can live with. Band together was going to do roughly that. That said, they keep having spells, and I'm falling further and further behind. So for now, let's see. What are my blocks? I'm at 11. Play the weird, which can let me get back cruelty, which can deal with the flyer. I can't deal with the worm yet. I'll happily chump it with the 1-1 and then remove the last counter to turn it into a 0-0. Zero, zero. This turn, though, I don't want to do that because it still has two counters. I might have to do it, but I'd be giving up value. If I take this, that's 10. Doesn't give me a lot of wiggle room. Um, so maybe I chump with Visionary now. So I wait to loot. Because I don't want to take another hit from Worm. So I think what I'm going to do, pass the turn, um, block Visionary on Worm. Because I'm probably going to have to take, like, a hit from an Arlen's Wolf or something. So I think Visionary on Worm here, take three from the Flyer. Loot, obviously, before it dies. I have the Swamp to discard. That makes a lot of sense. Um, so we go, like, Visionary on Worm. It's gonna be, like, Diviner on one of these. Oh, you can't block it, duh. What am I saying? Um, okay, well, I mean, that further solidifies Visionary on Worm. Um, what if I block everything on Worm? One, three, five, six. Because, I mean, this has a lot of toughness. Four, how are they gonna order it? Eh, might not be horrible if all these little creatures can't block their Arlen Wolves anyway. I wouldn't do it otherwise, of course. I would just throw Diviner on an Arlen Wolf and remove a counter. But I actually think it might be right. Because I have to, like, deal with this sooner or later. And it's not ideal, but I can't block the Arlen Wolf. Like, these little creatures all don't interact with Arlen Wolf. So at least they interact with Primordial Worm, and then maybe my removal will be able to stop the wolf or I'll draw something or whatever. Thanks for uh, subscribing, Office Magic. Really appreciate it. 19 months, long time. Let's see what's going on. Yeah, Finale could still win me this game. That's why I thought like two or three turns ago, even though I was pretty far behind, that I was actually like a favorite. Because I'm looting every turn. I have two Tamiyo's Epiphanies, and I'm like, I have Finale sooner or later. Kaya will buy a lot of time. I've got all like you know, removal, like, plenty of spells that can interact with this stuff. I mean, three twos are, these things are annoying, but, like, I have things that can block them. But, like, then I just drew, like, land after land and a few, like, pretty small and effective cards. And, like, not over a lot of turns. I'm just talking about over, like, maybe three turns. But those were the key three turns. So now we pretty much have to draw Finale or something. Finale kills three creatures. So it basically effectively clears the board. It can kill, like, any three of their creatures. I like how long the opponent's taking. Oh, they're thinking about ordering. Because I was like, if they have any trick here, I'm going to concede. Like, they'll just literally kill all my creatures and not even lose the worm. But, uh, yeah, they were thinking about how to order it. Okay, so that's seven exactly. The counters would come off the back stuff. Obviously, I want to remove a counter draw card, and I want to loot. We want to draw the card first, because we're going to do that no matter what. It can influence our loot. No, because we have a swamp, we're going to discard that no matter what. So let's do that first. Wait, no, having more cards would give me, eh, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna discard the swamp no matter what. I'm gonna draw I'm gonna I'm gonna keep the visionary card and the diviner card no matter what. The order actually just doesn't matter right now. Two, three, four, six. Oh right, I can't I can't remove the counter. Yeah, yeah, that would have been a horrible punt. I'm dealing exactly six to it. Yeah, yeah. You're right, Chad, as usual. This is the exact kind of mistake I make. Like, I make plenty of mistakes not on stream, to be clear. I'm far from a perfect player. But that's the exact kind of mistake I make on stream and not off. Because after finishing my thought, instead of, like, executing the plan, I'm like, what else can I, like, you know, communicate? So then I start, like, on a different line of logic. Um, all right, so we're at two. So we're dead if we don't finale. If we loot into finale, we're going to be a mana short of killing the griffin. So we're still dead, right? We can finale for three, so we can't kill the griffin. I mean, I'll loot just to see what it is, but... Game two. 
Yeah, that was a super flood. And look, those Arlen Wolves were really nice, though. If, if those were ordinary three drops that my cheap cards could have interacted with, I'd probably win that game. Okay, so... We need to board out little creatures that are in here to block, because we saw a double Arlen Wolf. And we're going to be on the play, so we're not that worried about getting run over. So after I told you 18 times how Wall of Runes is quite good, it's coming right out, game one. First chance I get. Um... Skulker blocks those pretty nicely, and pretty much everything except the giant thing I saw pretty nicely. Do we have any other, like, cheap bad blockers that should be ineffective? I mean, it's not, like, 2 mana 2-2. Two, two, this 2 mana 2-3 is great, whatever. The 1-4 is, like, this is, I mean, this is a rough matchup. I'm not going to lie. Those Arlen Wolves. If those were ordinary common 3-drops or whatever, like, that I could block, like, like I said, I'd probably win that game. This is not going to be easy. Um... The one fives obviously can't come in. They can't even block them. Yeah, Vanilla 5-4 looking playable but not good. Davriel looking playable but not good because I'm on the play. I mean, their deck's not like hyper aggro. Ha, <laughs> that's awesome. Thank you, Unfortunate Circumstances, for subscribing when I face the unfortunate circumstances of having a bunch of 1-4, 0-4, and 1-3 blockers, and my opponent has multiple 3-2s that say uh, creatures with power to or less can't block. I don't know if you did that on purpose or not, but I got a kick out of it. Um, okay, uh, let's see. So we probably actually want the white splash, right? Realm and arrow look excellent, and my little cheap blockers do not. So let's hypothetically say we get the white splash in there. So it would be like that probably, and then I wouldn't have to play something that bad. Thunder Drake, not particularly exciting here, I don't think. And then like maybe we would take out... Actually, I have to take a little more land, I think, if I do that. But then also, like that. Yeah, that looks better to me. I mean, my cards interact now. Four sources for two cards. I don't really want the veto. Rather than something like Stealth Mission or like 5 mana, 5, 4 vanilla, this just looks better to me, right? Like the cards I'm boarding in are actually serviceable and all that. Gonna board out one weird... Only because it can't block, same deal. The thing it does best is block for three mana, and if I can't block their three drop with it, it's not a powerful card in the late game, like, on its own. It's good because you play it on turn three and don't fall behind, and then when, it's, when your three drop would normally become dead, it converts into removal card draw encounters. But if you can't block with that thing, it's not a good card. If you can't cast your spells with your hand, it's not a good hand. Have to mull this right. All right. Not a bad six. Not a bad six. And I think GG uh, G -G cards Mulligan as well. Um, just going to put back Plating, I think, pretty clearly. It's not a great opening hand card. We don't even have any creatures to protect. We're looking to go Globe, No Escape, any three drop, and then Slam Epiphany. So we're not going to put back a land because we're actually hoping to draw a land. And uh, Globe gives us a white source, helps us hit land four. We already have our three drop to not fall, our, fall, fall far behind for our powerful card drawing. And then we have our powerful card drawing. Pretty much all you could ask for on the play after a Mulligan. I did get very flooded last game. That I'm not like gonna be like, no, it wasn't flood. Obviously, it was super flood. I didn't count, but I would no escape pretty much anything here because I'm gonna tap out like indefinitely. It's a pretty weak card. So I was hoping for an Arlen Wolf. The thing is. So, when you're deciding whether to strand your mana and save, like, a removal or counter for a better card or cast it, the main factor after how good the card you're interacting with, like, obviously that's number one, but after that, is how much you're going to be able to spend your mana for the rest of the game. The sooner you're going to have unspent mana on later turns, the better it is to not counter here and save this for a more powerful card. I can go, like, Relentless Advance into Epiphany, into the Epiphany spells. Like, I'm playing a 16 land deck with another Epiphany. I may never have unspent mana before this game ends the entire rest of the game. So I'm just going to cast it. Okay, I'll take it. We can already cast it off globe. And again, we're about to draw, we're going to draw cards and stuff. What we want is to not fall behind. Like, I'm amassing because a 3 3 interacts profitably against a 2 2, and I'll just play the card drawing next turn. But, like, you know, the card drawing is much more impactful that over the, like, where this game's going than I expect this 3-3 to be. Now, of course, we'll Epiphany. We don't really need um, to Divine Arrow this turn. Pretty much any lands on the bottom, any solid spells on the top. And I think I boarded out pretty much all my super weak spells. That is the advantage of boarding in the two good uh, removal spells from the third color.
opponent's really in the tank. I mean, I'd like to think... Normally, if my opponent's this deep in the tank, I'd be telling you what I think they're thinking about, but I don't even know what cards are in War of the Spark. Like, when they play it, I'll recognize it, but, like, I can't name all the white and green, like, removal and tricks and stuff in this, in this format, so... We're just gonna sit here and sweat it out together. I feel good about this game. I mean, I don't know what's in their hand, but... Skulker, Diviner, and Arrow all look pretty good, and, like, just like last game, my library's pretty loaded. Three Spellkeeper Weirds to get back the Epiphany... Another Epiphany, Kaya, Finale. Like, I have a lot of really strong cards in there. Um, okay, so our choice now is Diviner and Arrow or Skulker. Skulker has the ability to take out Domri, so I like that. Can it block on board? Yeah, they can't minus two. The plus one, you know, doesn't do anything effective here. Okay, so I'm going to assume their last card probably can't interact with Skulker and just play it. Hopefully not. If it can, I might lose. But if it can't, then I can give it unblockable, kill Domri, and then play Diviner and have Arrow up, and I'm looking great. So this is a huge turn. Hopefully they uh, just can't kill Skulker or anything crazy. Like, they can play a creature or something. Like, I'm, I just need Skulker. I need to untap with Skulker, kill Domri, and then, like, play these, and that'll be a great turn. Unfortunately, that didn't happen, obviously. Now, back is to the wall. The game is not over, of course, but back to the wall. Like, if I draw final, whatever, we win. And if not, whatever, I can play three cards. But now I have next to no power, and I'm going to have to draw my good cards to be able to win. So, like, now I think we're in a losing position, but if I draw, like, Finale or Epiphany or, like, Spellkeeper Weird, and they can't kill it, I can get back the Epiphany or something. But I think, like, now I think we're not a favorite in this game. If that Skulker lived, I think I would have been a favorite. Which is kind of what I'm saying. Like, last week, my opponent just didn't have that last band together. We played tough games, and my back was to the wall, but then they didn't have that band together, and then I, like, turned the game. I, I talk time and time and time again. Magic's the best game ever. It's so skill-intensive. The decisions are incredible. I've been playing Magic for 26 years, and I make plays every game that, if I, don't, that I don't know if they're right or wrong. Think about how incredible that is. Like, what other strategy game... Are you going to have somebody with five Pro Tour Top 8s in the Magic Hall of Fame who's been playing the game for 26 years and is like, every game I play, there's at least one decision I don't know if I made the best or second best choice. Like, every single game, basically. Obviously, that's not literally true. There are games where I'm mana screwed or whatever. But, like, basically every normal game where I have decisions and I have a decent amount of resources, I don't believe. But where I'm going with this, those decisions very rarely determine the game. Because if you know how to think about the game correctly, you're usually evaluating two close options. One of them is worth 1% or 2% more than the other. And so those decisions very rarely actually determine the outcome of the game. So I always say magic is extremely skill intensive and extremely not skill rewarding. So you just got to take your wins and losses both with a grain of salt. You got to be humble about your wins. You got to like, you know, accept your losses and you just, you know, play for that, you know, play for that percent that you can fight over is what I always say. Okay, so here, let's see what's going on. Um, okay, so if I kill that, they get to proliferate the Domri. That's, like, not great, not horrible. It's not like it has some kind of, ultim like, incredible ultimate. Now they can fight away a creature like Diviner. That's a pretty good creature. Um, I don't, so I don't really want that to happen. Um, but what are my real choices here? I mean, if I take it, I'm going to have to block next turn. Maybe better to make this fight next turn than this turn, though. Um, let's see... I do not play bridge, no. Uh, I, I have played a lot of games just casually and stuff, you know, but, like, I, I don't think I've ever played a game of bridge. Um, okay, so do I block, arrow, or take it? All are reasonable. Obviously, if I block, it's with Prismite. Um, I don't think they're holding much. The attack with only one creature signifies that they're afraid I'll be able to attack Domri out, like if I have a removal or a bounce or something. So I think they're going to play one creature or nothing here. I think I'm just going to take it. I don't really want them to proliferate Domri this turn when I can maybe threaten it. Like, they might not have anything, and I might draw a bounce or removal and kill Domri. So, I, I don't know. So, let's see. Now we can Callous Dismissal, get rid of the 3-4. I guess I'm still short on killing Domri, but... Um, and then if I attack Domri with both, if they block with the Martyr, it goes to 4... Domri goes to one. They can't fight anything. And then the Martyr, so it goes to two. So they basically still can't fight anything. Like, they can, but, like, I wouldn't care. Um, because they would lose Domri. So that looks okay if I'm not going to be dead. I mean, they'll, they'll get to trade Diviner 
for Martyr, which is a very bad trade for me, but I don't think I'm really in a position to be pulling counters. Well, I guess I'm going to chump and pull the one for a card, and a card is pretty valuable. Like, my library is really loaded. Um, so do I just sit back? I can bounce, like, the three, four. Oh, and then I can just attack Domri with only Prismite. That looks excellent, actually. And then even if they fight off a blocker, I have Arrow. Yeah, that looks good. I don't care if they gain the life one bit. And now this forces them to either lose the two Domri counters or trade with Prismite. And then for them to kill me, they need one of these to get through. I've got two blockers up. They might kill one with Domri, but if it goes to one, they can't even do that. And I've got Arrow as backup, so yeah. We'll send just Prismite. This is 100% the right line. It's embarrassing that it took me this long to find it, except that this is like the second game of War Spark I've played in a year or whatever. I haven't played with these cards in over a year. But yeah, this is 100% the right line this turn. It's just Dismissal to 3-4, Prismite attacks down, repass the turn. Like, everything going on is profitable. guess the only other thing I could really have considered, which I didn't, but I should have, is bouncing my own Guild Globe, because I get another card that way. But then I can't attack Domri with Prismite, and this is an excellent attack. And then I, they also have an extra lethal threat in play, so I think, like, I should consider that, but because I'm at three and not four, all three of these threats are lethal, I don't want to be bouncing my own Globe here. If I was literally at four instead of three, it might have been right to Callous Dismissal my own Globe and pass the turn, replay it and pass the turn. That's how awesome, you see how awesome magic is? I honestly don't know it, which play is right, but I believe at three I made the right play, and I believe at four the optimal play would be to bounce Guild Globe instead of the the two four. Pretty cool game, huh? No, of course I didn't pick War of the Spark. I chose Dominaria for this week, but Dominaria literally hits next week, so they're just like you know going to do War this week and do Dom next week, which makes total sense. It's a lot cooler if we do Dom when y'all have the opportunity to play it too, right? Like, just on Arena at large. So we'll wait one week on Dominaria on my pick. So they're going to go for the win here, effectively, basically. So this is cool. So I can remove the counter and draw a card. That doesn't give haste, so then I can just kill the Martyr with Divine Arrow so I don't miss the card. So, this looks good. And then if I do spike the Instant Removal or something, it's like a huge blowout. Sadly, I did not do that. Alright, see what's going on. So I'm going to have to block the Centaur with the Weird. And, the, ugh, another, like... More counters? The Stomery's going to have a million counters. Thankfully, he doesn't have an ultimate. Oh, no, they just went with the plus one plus one counter, which was definitely right. Wow, um, am I dead? Look how tight this is. Again, if I was at four instead of three. Um, if, so they have two three-powered creatures. If I, I, can only, I can't play, I don't have enough mana to play both of these. If I Kaya the Domri, I take four. If I Kaya one of the blockers, I take th one of the creatures, I take three. If I play weird, I take three. They're going to attack with both. I think, I think we've lost. Sick game. Awesome game, really. One more life, I could be in a very winning position here. I'm not saying I would win, it would just, you know, I very likely could. This is a great game of Magic. But yeah, I don't think I can win, so... I'm gonna just play Kaya and hope they don't realize that, like, they can attack for lethal, so they attack out Kaya just kind of reflexively. I don't expect that to happen, but I think that's not... It's like a, you know, 1% or 2% or not 1 in a million or something. Planeswalkers pretty reflexively get attacked, so if they forget to look at my life total or something, eh. Good games. Good games, GG cards. Good games. You cannot sack weird the turn you play it. You, ca I think you can at instant speed. I'm pretty sure, but it's affected by summoning sickness. So the turn you the turn you play it, you cannot sack it. I think this deck, you know, was fine. I don't think it was anything special, but like obviously, I see a lot of cards, so I could win a lot of games with finale. I didn't see finale either game kind of drafted around finale, like we started with it. So I'm like, let me draft defensive stuff, card drawing, scry, blah 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 blah. I think that came together just fine. I, could, I probably win both those games with Finale. I'm not saying I'm supposed to see it. I saw around half my deck, 50-50 each game. And they were good games. So we lost some close games. I think this deck was like dead average. I don't think it was bad or good. 
So that was super short. I'm not going to fire a draft. Like I said, uh, I've got some stuff I really need to get to, but I've got a little bit of time. So uh, let's play out that best of one that I was in the middle of when you signed on. I'll show you the deck real quickly. We'll play a couple games. I think I'm already like four and one or something. And it's actually a pretty sweet deck. So I'll finish that out before I call it a night here. Um, yeah, so we're four and one. I think I got like a little blue, green, splash, red, if I remember. This is a deck I draft a ton in this format. It, uh, it's just really controlling, ramping, like Quandrix. You know, obviously it has a great, this deck has an incredible late game with two bookworms. Like it's basically outside of like Mythics and stuff, like the best late game. And like uh, two Eureka Moments, two Emergent Sequences. So this is like, you know, almost like a weak standard ramp deck with a good late game. I'm not like the world's best at removing things. I wouldn't have played the exponential growth. I think it generally offers decks like this not very much because you should win the late game anyway. But it plus Bookworm just wins any game. And I have a crash through too. So it feels like I can win like a lot of games like that. Um, so yeah, this is the deck. Uh, I'm not going to do another draft, but I'm going to finish this whole run out. So we're four and one. So, ho so hopefully you'll be here for exactly three more games if you hang out because five wins, six wins, seven wins, trophy, good times. Good luck to GG cards the rest of the way. I felt like the games were good. Kind of the opposite of last week. Like I said, felt like things just broke my way in close games. Drew my good cards. This time saw a lot of cards. Didn't find finale. Got a little flooded. Things didn't really break my way. We'll be back next week. I think it's Dom next week. Hopefully we can uh, get it done then. I'll count that as a pseudo back-to-back. -back. Obviously I didn't win this week, but I requested Dom, not War of the Spark, and the winner gets to request. So that's my format. All right. I don't know if doing it now or at the end of their turn makes a difference. Like, I do not believe there's anything they could ever do that would get me to do that. So I'm just doing it now to save, like, time. Let the auto passer work. I guess if there was some kind of profitable way to sack it or bounce it in response, which is unlikely but not impossible, they could theoretically play that card and then fizzle the charge through. Like, I wouldn't get the card because this only targets the one creature. So I probably should have Elemental Masterpiece there and then Eureka Moment in this turn. Um, I mean, I'm not under pressure. Like, they're obviously not, like, an aggro deck at all. So it's a close call. Like, I would be a whole turn faster, and I don't need the resources. But I also don't really need to be a turn faster. Like, I'm taking no damage. So, like, this is the kind of situation where, like, the more pressure you're under... The more you wanted to go like elemental masterpiece in a Eureka moment this game, if I if you had the ability to just go island, island, Eureka moment, turn three forest, uh, turn turn island, island, discard masterpiece, turn three forest, Eureka moment, the more pressure you're going to be under, the more you want to do that because you're discarding this to, you know, be a whole turn faster. So if your opponent was like pressuring you at all, it would be the right play, but they've played five turns and I'm at 18 and they have three power on the board. So I actually think my line was probably right, but I certainly should have discussed it at the time and considered it on turn two or one before I made it impossible to take that line. I mean, I probably had two islands in my hand by turn two. I might have played a forest turn one because I wasn't thinking about it, but I don't really remember what I had on turn two, but I mean, I've drawn five islands. Um, okay, so can't even helix. We don't have anything to return. So looks like we're chilling. It's funny because I think now I am going to discard the Masterpiece to play Bookworm, but only because we haven't drawn anything else. Like, if I had, um, you know, like, if I had a red mana, I would never make that play this turn. But if I don't do it, I'm doing nothing next turn. And even if they counter it, I have a second Bookworm and he looks to get it back, so. So, obviously, it would have been way better had I done it on turn two in retrospect. But if I had drawn a Mountain over all these cards or whatever, I wouldn't do it right now. And I think... It's really close, and you just have to assess the information. The real concept I wanted to communicate is the more pressure you're under, the more you want to make that take that line. The more pressure you're under, the more you want to trade resources to speed up, which is obviously intuitive. Um, but some people would probably not think about that on turn two, like me, like I didn't. Okay, so seven, eight mana, just going to play Bookworm. I mean, the treasure lets us cast Prismari Command, but Prismari Command is not, like, super impressive right now. Like, I can deal two and loot or something. I don't have anything I want to discard, really. 
Um, or deal two and make a treasure so I can play my next red card if I draw one. And, I mean, Bookworm is just, you know, a, fine, a really good card. If I draw a card off this Bookworm, a draw step, a card off the next Bookworm, a draw step, I'm pretty likely to find red by then anyway. No land, no land, no land. I have negate. Every turn after this, I can counter it. No land this turn. Wait, no. I mean, look, I can beat that card. Obviously, Bookworm's bigger than the ground creatures. I've got plenty of life. It can kill the fly or whatever. But if they wait and I get to negate their 7-mana Mythic, like, best card in the format card, which it literally is, that would be pretty sweet. And that's already the case, because if they played a 1-mana card, that they can't play their 7. I don't think it was a choice. I believe that Alpha here doesn't have land 7 in hand, which means they have 3 spells in hand, which means this is they are going to have a lot of firepower. But I'm actually cool with that. Are they going to have more firepower than Double Bookworm Helix and they like, my hand? Probably not. My concern would be if they were able to swarm me, like kind of the way I lost game two to GG cards, where if I could have put both cards in play, I would have probably been a favorite in that game, but I just took exactly lethal and died on the last turn. Um, okay, so what do we want to do here? Uh, just play the other bookworm, certainly a fine option, but then if they top deck a land, they play the mascot ex exhibition. We know they're not holding one. If I pass, that's actually looking pretty good, especially since I drew the red mana and I can like command the symmetry sage. And they have no attack on board as long as I don't attack. And it's not like they're going to bury in Book's Bookworm or something. I have negate and divide by zero. So I'm really not at much risk. And this lets me negate Mascot Exhibition. Now look, they have two other spells in hand. If they can copy one, they may not play the Mascot Exhibition. But if they go, if they play a spell and they don't want to copy it, I'll just let it resolve. If they go to copy it, I can negate it in response. And then this goes back to their hand. They get neither copy. And then maybe they'll resolve Exhibition later, but I'll have two Bookworms and a lot going. Okay, that said, do I negate two four fours? Yeah, probably. But you know what? Divide by zero looks even better, right? This is just like a time walk. Three mana for, for three mana for seven. I'm gonna get further ahead. I like it. Start from scratch. Not doing much. Fractal summoning looks excellent. Gonna be the biggest creature on the board. So now we can Prismari command two to that and just make a treasure, I think. That treasure could be really valuable for us. Here's why. Uh, we want to play Bookworms, and we want to have Negate up. So getting the 10 next turn, which we do if we make the treasure, lets us do that. I shouldn't have played the land until after the Bookworm, but obviously that's like the most minor of mistakes. And I wanted to show you that now with 9 plus this, I cast a Bookworm. Now look, they know I still have 2 up if they want to play around Negate, but that doesn't matter. I get to put my Bookworm in play, and I can negate one of their 7 mana spells. So we pretty much just won the game. Looks like Bet Alpha agrees. Yeah, Swimming covered it well. Toy Wiz and a couple other people said that. I played Forest not for no reason, just to cast Charge through. But I think I also had Island Island and the 7 matter blue red card in hand at the time. I don't, like, I, I think I might have had Eureka's moment up, but I might not have. I think I might have drawn that off the Charge through. My memory's not perfect, and this was of very little importance. Um, but whatever. Let's pretend I couldn't have. Let's pretend I didn't have the 7 matter card in my hand, like, on turn 1. Who cares? The point in here is more to learn than to make the right or the wrong play, right? Like, what's interesting is analyzing what was right and what could have been right, not, like, what actually happened, you know? Like, I mean, that's, you know, the driver for all the analysis, but you get the point. What matters is, like, what actually happened and the theoretical possibilities and what leads to the best outcome given that situation. Like, analyzing the situation. Like, at this point, it doesn't actually matter what actually happened. Okay, another great hand. Turn to Quandrix Apprentice. Here I'm going to play the tap land, not the charge through, no question. We are, I mean, there's no one drop in play, but even if I, even if this card didn't require a creature in play, I would still make the exact same play because it can be one mana uh, draw a card and put a basic land in our hand. And we already have a two drop, so we don't need to increase our chances at hitting, hitting one. All right, I hope they don't kill it. I'm not really worried about it. Um, I'd definitely rather sequence than pop quiz this turn. So I think the only thing is might as well sequence pre-combat in case they do somehow kill Apprentice in combat, um, like with Befuddler or something like that. 
So we're going to attack with Apprentice because we don't really need more lands. And we're going to get to play Charge Through and Sequence this turn anyway. But we don't want to spew a free land off Sequence. So we'll just do it pre-combat. So Forest... Oh, here's another thing that comes up in this format with Emergent Sequence. that is, It might seriously have never came up before. I guess it comes up with Mill a little bit also. So when you're splashing and, and you don't have like a bunch of like, let's say, blue-red um, campuses, imagine I was only playing one mountain in the stack. I'd have enough red sources because I have like double Emergent Sequence. But if I search out my mountain and they kill it, now my red cards are off for the rest of the game. So if you're gonna, if you have emergent sequence, you normally want to play two of your splash land instead of one because you want to be able to go get it, and you have to be able to go get it, right? Because if you don't go get it, like you might draw a red card and not be able to cast it. So you, so when you cast emergent sequence, you unless you already have your splash color, you need to be able to go search for it. This way, if you draw your splash color cards, you can cast them. But if they kill it and you only have one in your deck your splash color would be off for the rest of the game. You just literally have no ability to cast your splash cards, right? So most of the time, if I'm going to have three or four sources, I'll only play one basic of my splash color and including ways to search for it. But with emergent sequence, that it's more like, you know, it, can, it dies a lot of the time. Bolt the bird is like one of the, probably the most repeated like thing in all of magic, you know, as far as strategy. So you want to have a second basic if you haven't figured that out yet. I know the format's been out for a long time, but you know, whatever. I haven't been streaming in a lot. So you're getting a, you're getting some information from me later than usual. All right, so let's see what's going on here. Um, so we can pop quiz or divide by zero. Neither option looks incredible. Um, probably not that interested in divide by zeroing their four drop here. Plus it can bounce things once they're in play anyway. So I think we pop quiz main phase just in case we draw something we want to play. I uh, don't think think we're attacking or blocking this mountain and our red cards are even that cheap so we certainly should tap like this so none of those look incredible right now fractal summoning is pretty good with biomathematician i don't see myself introduction to annihilationing like next turn like what four mana card are they going to play Yeah, I agree with that, target player. Uh, I, I totally agree with that. It just doesn't super talk about the specific concept I was highlighting, that you actually have to put a second basic in your deck, even when you have enough sources with just one. I mean, I guess, like, because the steward will die, but my point is you're going to search for that basic, like, almost every time. And then, like, you know, it's just a different point. But I agree with what you said as well. I agree that uh, Emergent is less rampant growth and more steward of Valoran. Definitely agree with that. Oh, I see your point. So you're basically saying it don't count it as a source. But like it's weird because like I I would I would you can count it as a source as long as you can search for the mountain. So if you have two or three mountains, then you can count your um your emergent sequence as a red source. You just like can't have only one and count it as a source basically. Okay, so I, whether or not you fractal something for 4 here is close cuz obviously we could sit on divide by 0. Given biomathematician is going to grow it, Elemental master. I mean, uh, elemental masterpiece costs seven, and we have six. I think it's a pretty clear play. Yes, this can make an eight-eight in five turns, but just like I talked about in my game against GG cards, just like uh, just like I um, against GG cards when I was like, so like you want to the more you want to tap your mana now, like to play this counter on a weak spell, is based on how much you're going to tap your mana after this. So like it's the same thing. Like, I'm gonna, I have a seven to play, then I have a three mana card to play that lets me put Introduction to Annihilation in my hand, and I have a three mana card to play. So I have effectively like seven, 10, 13, 18 mana worth of cards in my hand, because I know Divide by Zero, as long as it resolves, will turn into like Introduction to Annihilation at the least. Okay, so if I want to attack with this, I need to grow it to a five, five. That's a really meaningful power and toughness, because it will give them no good block on it. If, if I do that, what am I doing with the rest of my mana this turn? Kelpie Guide. That's a pretty good play. That's going to be at 8 soon. Or my other option is Slam 2, 4, 4 Elementals. Normally, I would Elemental Masterpiece here, but if I attack with the 4, 4, they block the 1, 5. If I attack with the 5, 5, they literally don't have a profitable block. So I think that makes it worth it. 
Um, just play the land so I can have divide by zero up in case they go to counter it. I'll like divide by zero in response. Get it back in my hand and fizzle the counter. Not going to send my 3-3 Mountain because I don't want to even trade it with the Pledge Mage. That, that would uh, turn off my ability to cast Masterpiece. Yeah, that's really good advice. Uh, target player saying, like, if you only played one Mountain, like, I don't think they're debating either way the, like, two thing. Like, so it's going to be correct to play two way more than it is in most formats. But if you only play one, if you have an environmental sciences, so you probably have a lot of ways to get the mountain anyway later, you should probably, even if you don't have a red source yet, be emergent sequencing for, like, an island or forest so that they can't kill your only mountain. And you can just get it later with sciences and then play it as a non-creature. That's really good advice. But also, if you don't have a sciences or if you just can afford the sources, which you often can in this format, then you just play, like, two to three instead of one. So I think both those points are valid. Um, okay, so do I want to kill the 1-5 or the 2 creatures? Definitely the 2. They're probably going to go and play minus 4, minus 0, and then I'm going to have a choice. Bounce that. Trade my 5-5 five, five for their 2 creatures. Bounce, let it resolve. Bounce the 3-3, uh, three, three, and then my creature just bounces off theirs and doesn't die. Sorry. Uh, well, no, yeah, I can't bounce the 1-5 because it would still die, so I'll have to bounce like Spectacle Mage. Um, for now, I'm going to pass, because if they don't do anything, I'm super happy with this trade. So I'm not going to, like, lead divide by zero here and then let them play their trick. So there's the subtraction. We didn't know they had that, but once they blocked, we pretty much knew they had that. Um, so now, divide by zero. Think we just bounce that. Like, we can play around it in the future, and this trade is quite good for us, I think. Yeah, I got the vaccine. I'm, like, about as vaccinated as you can be. I got the second shot, like, a month ago or something. Thanks for asking, throwing bows. Now, remember, it protects against COVID, not bows. So don't go around elbowing people. All right, let's see. Three, five, six, seven, eight. Eight to work with this turn. So it's, like, Masterpiece or Guide and Annihilation, probably. Um... So let's see, in order to have a profitable attack, we'd have to Annihilation, neither target is very good, and they have Arcane Subtraction up. So I'm not really looking to attack this turn. Um, they may counter Masterpiece, like with Negate, but I mean, it, Negate is an Archive card. I don't think there's like, like, commons or uncommons in the actual set they can have. And they're probably just leaving their mana up for Subtraction. So I think this turn is just cast Masterpiece and pass the turn. Yeah, Test of Talents is an uncommon that can do it. You're right. Not like any big deal, obviously. I only have the one, and if, even if I had another one in my library, who would really care? But, good point. There is an uncommon that counters Masterpiece. And th in this format, Negate and Test of Talents are literally, and, I've the, and I don't say this lightly, the best I've ever seen them be. I have never seen two mana counter a non-creature perform as well as it does in this format. I'm not saying they're broken cards, but I view them basically the way I normally view, like, three to four mana blue, like, removal common. You know, like, like I'm happy to, like, third, fourth pick it for a blue deck. If I have to first pick it, I do, but I'm not happy about it. Like, Negate and Test of Talents are just good cards in this format. Just, you know, like the claustrophobia. Like, that level good, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, Guide and Annihilation is 8, sorry. But we had 8, that, which is what I said. Like, what, what we can do with 8 mana. I may have muttered it was 7 or something, but basically it was an option. Um, okay, so what can we do here? If I Annihilate the 1-5, they have shields down. I get a good attack with a 4-4 four, four, and a 3-3. Three, three. I mean, they still have a lot of life, though. I think I might do that if I have nothing better to do. But also, Kelpie Guide kills things. I think what we really want to do this turn is Eureka Moment. And then see what we get. But if we have to go Kelpie Guide and Emergent Sequence, we'll have put three lands in play this turn. So Sequence will make a 3-3. Three, three. And then we have a Tapper, so that next turn we can go Tap and Removal and just, like, have a great attack. So as long as they don't blow up the board with that rare that does, like, five to everything, we should be good. So I think we're going to wait for patiently for one more turn. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'll probably attack with the 4-4 four, four, and the 3-3 three, three here. 
because um, that's basically free. Like, I have no problem with trading the 3-3 for the 2-3 if they want to double lock and take 4. But, um, yeah, I don't think we want to use our removal or make, like, a big attack or anything like that. Um, so, yeah. I don't need blockers back, so these two, I think, can attack profitably. 1-5 on 4-4, four, four, take 3, or double block 3-3, three, three, take 4. I'm happy with either of those. I'm trading the 3-3 three, three for 2-3, three, very small trade down to get in 4 damage, and this turns into a 3-3 three, three unblockable later. So in reality, if they double block here, this is around an even trade to get in 3 damage, and if they uh, put, take, put the 1-5 on the 4-4 four, four and take 3, it's 3 damage. And if they take 7, all the better. I mean, I know I'm not an aggro deck, but I don't know why they wouldn't put the 1-5 on the 4-4. Four, four. They really want to buy back Pigment Storm. Um, what does that signify? Even if they have the deal 5 to everything, it would kill the 1-5. It's not like it's deal 4 to everything. Like, they don't have a 4-mana card, only a 5-mana card. I don't know. I think I'm considering, now that I drew Prismari Command, and I feel like they just took a lot of damage and I'm up by a lot, not playing Kelpie Guide. I'm going to play Emergent Sequence, because it's going to make a 3-3 this turn, and it's, like, never going to do more than that. But I can leave Prismari Command up to use the mana, so I think I'm just going to chill on the Kelpie Guide in case they have a Sweeper. I just feel like, I don't know, like... I don't know how else I can really lose this game. Like, my my deck is good for the late game. I'm not, like, an aggro deck, and I have so much ammo, and I barely even have lands left in my deck. Not because I'm flooded. I just put six lands in my hand because I played turn two Apprentice or whatever. But I'm going to play around a sweeper a little bit here because I think we're winning by enough to do that. So this just looks like I'll draw two discard two since I have three lands I can loot away. Thank you again, Quandrix Apprentice. Really appreciate your service. And honestly, two to them, not exciting, uh, gotta make sh sure I'm doing the right one. Yeah, any target and then target player for the draw two. That's me. Two to them, not exciting, but I've got six creatures there too and a removal in hand and I'm about to draw two more cards. So I'll put them from 11 to nine. I don't really mind in this situation. All right, easy discard two lands. Who really cares which? I don't know how they're gonna survive, but let's see. Introduction with negate up seven. So we still have another four to play. So to, to use only three if we want to attack with the lands, which we do. Yeah, so basically we can't cast anything besides Introduction and Negate unless we think we can find better than that. And I don't think we either need better than that or are likely to find it. So I'm just going to start here with Introduction while my mana's up. Maybe it means I can pay for some kind of uncommon or rare archive counter or something like that. I think Spell Pierce does exist, though I think it's highly unlikely. And I've played this game very slow and patiently. That is over. Bide my time, made some profitable attacks, and should be a head explosion. Since you can't negate Heated Debate, if they lead Arcane Subtraction, I, I'm going to negate it. If literally every single thing in the format was exactly the same, uh, I'm but not that I'm like I uh, but heated debate could be countered. I might not counter subtraction. I know it's not lethal if I don't counter it, but like they could very easily have two things. They've done so little this game, uh, but obviously I don't have to counter that because now I'll just counter the uh, subtraction and they're dead. They have to resolve one thing on an on-block creature to not be dead. So it's interesting if they play the potential worst of the two first, like subtraction before heated debate or something. I, I know you can't counter heated debate. I'm just saying hypothetically, if every single thing in the format was exactly the same, but heated debate didn't have the text can't be countered, I think it would be, if they led subtraction there with three open, I think it would be really interesting whether you negated it or not. And I probably wouldn't, even though it's literally lethal if they have nothing, let them save four life on tap, six creatures to one. Now I have negate for the red rare, or I have negate for like a better removal rather than the minus four. Now heated debate can't be countered, so in this case I would negate the arcane subtraction. This is a theoretical. All right, we're six and one. Hopefully the last game of the night. Not because I hate y'all, but I like winning at least a little bit. Probably not as much as most pros, to be honest. Probably a lot less than most pros. I'd rather commentate a game, I think, than win it. But I'd rather win it than lose it, so... We're still going to try and do that. Yeah, the Barian Books works as well there. And it's not incredible because they're only killing a 3-3 with it. You know, it's not like I had a 7-7 seven, seven Fractal or anything. But I certainly would rather negate um, Barian Books than Arcane Subtraction in that spot. You are right, Satane. 
and I was winning by enough, and, like, red blue's power cards are, like, almost all spells, and I have negate. So, like, let's say I don't negate the subtraction, and then they don't have burying books. Who cares? What are they going to do? They're going to get, like, fractal summoning. I'll negate it for the win. They're going to cast elemental masterpiece. I'll negate it for the win. What are they going to play? Like, some six mana red blue creature down six creatures to one at three? They have to play a spell. All right, not the world's best hand, but I'm one land away from, you know, a great hand. I mean, if they don't kill Apprentice and I draw one land by turn three, I'll never miss another land drop. Oh, I've done it too, target player. <laughs> it doesn't mean you suck. I know most people here are probably not familiar with Saul, but he's a very good player, and, like, we've all done that. Thanks, Tazy Lurtle. Did Lazy Turtle get boring, or uh, did somebody hijack the account? All right, there's the one land I really wanted to draw while I drew it last turn, but Mountain is nice too. Um, so let's see, do I want this trade? No. Do I hold Biomathematician to grow things? I mean, it would be nice to lock up lands off Apprentice for value, but I don't. now I'm pretty good. I mean, I already have four since I drew two straight. Pop Quiz draws another card. Like, I don't think that's a big concern. If I don't play the Biomathematician, I'm taking two. If I pop quiz, it helps me at the land drops. What am I really going to get? I don't really have a good lesson for this early, right? Like, I have good lessons. I have Containment Breach, Introduction to Annihilation, and Fractal Summoning. But I don't have any lessons I really want to play next turn. I think I'm just going to play Biomathematician. It's really not that scary if they, uh, like, kill the Apprentice and don't get any lands off it. Like, four plus these two cards to play. I could play Rowan here, like I can protect it, but I would, if I did that, I would have to trade Apprentice for Amplomancer, and Rowan is so much worse than Will. Like, I'll play Rowan if I have, like, exactly three lands, but given I think I'm pretty close to 100% to have land five, turn five, I don't want to play Rowan instead of Will. The plan now, I think, is just chill, keep the board even, and then slam Will and draw cards, like, which frankly is a pretty good path to victory. Thank you, Andy Pip88. Appreciate the subscription. You're welcome, Kenyan Thunder. And I'm glad you're liking, um, whatchamacallit, MH2. I did a few, but I just like, eh, it's fine. It feels good, kind of good, but I really didn't. Just being on Magic Online is just too painful for me right now. I don't understand why they don't put MH2 on Arena in Phantom. Like, just have cues so we can draft. The cards can disappear. Make it cheap. Let us just play, a, you know, let's pay like a few hundred gems and play some Phantom drafts for a few packs. Experience a good draft format and then have the cards just vanish. Like, I don't know. It's not my company. I'm very grateful for the product Watsi has given us, but obviously I would do a lot of things differently than them. Um, okay, so end of turn, divide by zero or pop quiz. Normally I would pop quiz, but if I'm going to play Will, I probably want to divide by zero. Death Touch doesn't work on Planeswalkers. Um, I don't know if I'm going to play Will now that they left their two up, though. They might have Negate or Test of Town. Well, Test doesn't work. Test is instant or sorcery. They might have Negate, though. Negate is the much rarer, rarer one. I mean, there's not, like, any great targets for Divide, but you do want to get your Planeswalkers going as soon as possible. This is kind of an interesting spot between Divide and Pop Quiz. Like, if I didn't have Pop Quiz, I'd 100% just Divide. Like, because, like, I'm not going to not spend that mana here. But with Pop Quiz as an option that doesn't impact the board but does let me spend the mana, it becomes closer. If I'm going to play Will, I definitely want to Divide. The flyer, the ground is pretty gummed up. I think I'm going to divide the Needlethorn Drake and just go for for, for uh, Will here. Because, I mean, like, they have to have Negate. And, like, Archives are rarer by a lot, I think, the commons and uncommons, right? So, like, Test of Talents, that's not, like, Negate. That's Instant or Sorcery. It would have to be, like, the Archive Negate, I think. It's really complicated, King of Gods. Uh, I'm going to write a long thing about OP at some point. By long, I don't mean, like, full-length article. I mean, like, probably, like, you know... I, I mean, I don't know how many words it's going to end up. But I'm going to write, basically, my thoughts in detail on OP. It'll probably end up being, like, 500 to 1,000 words or something. And then I'll, uh, you know, start spreading the link or whatever. Because, like, there's so much nuance and it's so complicated. Like, for example, I hate what they've done with OP. 
But I think getting rid of the leagues at this point makes sense because, like, they ruined them already, basically. So, like, you know, I mean, it's like, I don't even know. Like, do I support, like, getting rid of the leagues? Well, what's going to replace them? Like, could they have just been fixed instead? Was that an option? Like, I mean, like, you know, like, with their marketing budget, if they just did the things that would make organized play, you know, awesome, they have enough money in the budget to do it. I mean... Based on what they've spent in the past, obviously, I don't know what Hasbro is giving Watsy for, you know, 2022 or on or whatever. You know, like, based on what they had in the past, they had enough money to easily make an awesome OP that everybody loved instead of the current state of affairs. But who knows? For all for all I know, Hasbro told Watsy, like, you're getting no more money for OP starting in 2025. Wrap it up, right? I'm not saying that happened. I want to be clear. I have no inside information, which is important for me to say here. So everything I'm saying is my own speculation. I can reverse engineer their thought process probably as well as anybody and like, you know, consider all the factors and what's going on probably as well as anybody. But I have zero inside information of any kind. I want to be crystal clear. So even if I nail it exactly right, like don't don't get suspicious like later on or something. Um, but yeah, so I don't know, you know, that's, I have some theories that I don't really have any evidence, but are like, make their actions more reasonable. So I'm just basically seeing as things emerge, which of those theories I can eliminate until like one of them becomes the only one left, or I get some solid like reasoning that points in that direction. I really don't know why they chose to spend a ton of money disintegrating a 20 year built OP, like mind boggling to me, so. Um, okay, so, if they kill Will, at least I'll have gotten the two cards off it, so I think I want to minus it, because if I can't defend it, I just want to get the two cards. If I pop Quiz, I can get Containment Breach or Introduction to Annihilation. Oh, no Sweatic, so that's an awesome draft, and I'm not even sweatsuiting, then this is my last game. Uh, please, by all means. I have no idea what that was a response to, but, uh, Limited Resources versus Lords Team Draft sounds awesome. Um, let's see. Anyways, uh, okay, so, draw two or pop quiz for only two mana thanks to Will, and then I have three, four left to work with. So I can play Introduction thanks to Will, and then I can also use Will. Hmm, maybe I shouldn't draw cards. It looks like I actually can defend it. I mean, it's gonna take a hit from something, but I don't think it's gonna take six. Forgot about it lowering everything by one. That's pretty useful right now. Um, start from scratch, not doing anything. Containment Breach, not doing anything. Fractal would be for a 3-3. Three, three. So, is that better or worse than Introduction? Actually, I think it's better. Ah! Ran out of time. I'm sorry, y'all. Not the first time, won't be the last. Angelito's like, hmm, that went better than I expected. So if I didn't rope out there, it would have been land, fractal for three, will will plus shrinking like the flyer probably. Because I can always throw the three three in front of the amplomancer, and if they pump or if they tackle everything, no, I'd have to I have to target the amplomancer. Yeah, so it would have been it should have been land, summoning for three, will the amplomancer. Sorry, we're but we'll probably get another game out of this. It's probably a treat for y'all. See what's going on. Hopefully I won't cost myself the trophy. I think I'm six and one, so I think I get one more crack at it. Um, would have been tight. Can I overcome it now? Summoning for four is not really big enough. If I regrowth, divide by zero, reset the pledge mage. That's actually kind of decent because then it'll come back smaller and probably won't grow again. Um, and then I can get introduction to deal with the six, six. Yeah, that looks better. And then I can play a big fractal summoning, hopefully, when they're out of steam. And then hopefully it'll be bigger than the board. I think that's my best chance. I don't think it's great, but I think it's my best chance. Okay, so 2 2 doesn't have a profitable block on anything. So I think we're blocking Amplomancer. If they pump, they can't recast something. So we get a decent amount of value there because we're going to bounce uh, Pledge Mage because that's the one that it's a 4-4, four, four, but if we bounce it, it comes back as a 2-2. Two, two. And divide by zero, you can't bounce like tokens, which was good. This card is really good. And this is a format where people are Elemental Summoning, Inkling Summoning, Fractal Summoning. So while I've been kind of critical of this format because I don't really like it that much, I do want to give them credit for identifying that. 
If divide by Z, they, somebody saved a mistake here. This card almost for sure at some point in design did not say mana value one or greater. It just said return target spell or permanent, learn. And then they realized it was going to be way too good and limited with fractal summoning and like elemental summoning and all of that running around. So they added it so that it couldn't bounce tokens, which made it good but not busted. So whoever actually is out there in R&D who made that change, credit to you if you end up hearing my stream or whatever at some point. That's a really big save from a busted uncommon. Um, okay, so introduction. I wanted to highlight that because it's like you don't see the mistakes that like get caught and then fixed. So you don't even know that somebody did something good there unless you really go deep on that, right? Like we all see the mistakes and there's been many, you know, from Oro to Urza Saga, like, uh, they've been very... There's been some cards that I honestly have no idea what's going on. But that did make Limited substantially better, because that would have been a really busted on common if they literally let it bounce anything instead of non-token, basically. Okay, so anyway. Um, so we can Fractal for 5, or we can Introduction the 6-6. Six, six. If we Introduction the 6-6, six, six, if they hit us back for forward 8, that's still 4 turns from the Flyer. We have enough time to get the Kelpie Guide down. Um, if they want to pump and put us to six, okay, but then they're not adding the board. So that seems right. Well, I would guess that the name would come last there, that they named it divide by zero after they added the one line of text for like practical reasons. I mean, if it just had the name divide by zero and then they like, we're like, okay, what do we call? Like, I'm guessing they make cards and then give them names, not they give them names and then make cards around the names, basically. Obviously, I don't know the order every single time. There's probably, like, you know, cases that go the other way or something because, like, a card has a name and then they figure out, like, a cool way to change it to make it, like, line up with the name more. Like, you know, you don't just work on it once. But I would hope the actual starting was design cards and then name them, not, like, here are your names, now design cards around them. Um, okay, so, let's see. So, as planned, they put us to six. We can summoning, which will stop the Amplomancer, and then next turn we play the Kelpie Guide. I don't really see how we have any choices. If we played the Kelpie Guide this turn, we'd have to take the Amplomancer. It would just be the same or more damage. Three, six, eight. So, that's six mana. Yeah, oh, Negate won't shock me here at all, or Test of Talents wouldn't shock me here at all, but remember, this is the game, Burnator, where I, like, rope through that one turn, and this is still somewhat tight. I'm not saying I would have won, but I certainly wouldn't be under any pressure if I would have drawn those cards off, or if I would still have plus Will and Fractal Summoning for three and everything. But yeah, uh, I don't think, um, oh, I'm sure it goes in both examples, and I'm sure it goes both ways, Invictus, but yes, concepts and mechanics first, I would hope. Like, I would hope that they make cards and then name them and then try and make them cooler for the name if possible. That they wouldn't be like, oh, a card has a name divided by zero. Let's drastically change its effect on the format or whatever. You could just change the name. Okay, so. Six and two. Going to be the last game. Probably would have lost that game anyway, even if I didn't rope out. They still had a lot of business at the end. Would have been tight, though, so sorry about that. And let's try and uh, win this one, get the trophy, since we did not succeed in the sweatsuit tonight. Finish on a little high note here, and then who should we raid? Is GG card still cooking, or did they lose like round two or three after uh, they beat me? Uh, I guess it gives me an extra card for next turn, but I can always cycle the charge next turn or later turns for one mana, I mean... It's not like, you know, charge is hard to cycle at a later date. If I had, like, two sweepers or something where, like, I could play the charge first, and then if I hit a sweeper, I play it, and if I don't, I play summoning for one less, I'd be a lot more inclined to do it. But I don't really think... I, I didn't have nine, so it's not like I can draw Bookworm off of it. So I don't really think I'm drawing a card better than Fractal Summoning off charge through. So I think I'd rather just have the extra power and toughness. I mean, that might get me past a Mage Duel or a Fractal Summoning of theirs or something like that. That's pretty funny, Madu Mania. Go get that mountain. If they kill it, no problem. We still have another one to search out later. Of 
Of course, if they don't, all the better. So which of our good four drops do we want to play? Professor hits harder now, obviously, but if we play Eureka Moment, we have six to work with instead of five next turn. Let's think like a turn ahead. What are we going to do with six? Um, pop Quiz and Prismari Command. And eh, that's not... Well, you know what? I've changed all my minds. I just realized they played a three mana ramp artifact, and I want to bolt the bird. And there's I can two for one them with Prismari Command. So I'm not I'm not even gonna be mana efficient. I'm just gonna use three mana instead of four and bolt the bird here on turn three. Well, definitely the chat is more about like, oh, you have to make like these awesome two for ones than me, like as soon as possible, because like I'd expect to have the same option a turn from now. Um the the four mana card here, like if I do it, I have five next turn. It's not like I can play two meaningful three mana cards. And, like, they have all farce out. I want to get rid of that letter of acceptance. This is effectively bolting the bird. It's only turn three. So I think that's a pretty clear line. All right, so tap land and four drop. This time it's pretty clear Eureka moment because we can't bookworm next turn either way. So next turn we'll look to go pop quiz and Eureka moment, hopefully. Like, obviously, Eureka moment first, play land, and then pop quiz. Hey, thanks for subscribing, Saul. Really appreciate it. Oh, this set not closed, Burnator. Oh, wait, you're saying labeled return to AVR, so it would have, like, the same mechanics and stuff, maybe, but they would do a much better job with it this time. Probably return to AVR, because it would at least be new. But if it was actual AVR, I would snap take Strixhaven again. It's not even close. Okay, so, if we draw land in two cards, we really want to cast Eureka Moment. But if we brick on that, we'd really want to cast Kelpie Guide and Pop Quiz and use six mana rather than Eureka Moment and just, like, cast nothing else this turn. So do we want to go Kelpie Guide, Pop Quiz, or Eureka Moment? Normally, I would make the more aggressive play. There's certainly more upside. It's just we're under no pressure. They have two cards in hand. I think we just make the more conservative play just because we're, like, winning by so much. So if we're going to go Kelpie Guide, Pop Quiz, then we might as well Pop Quiz first. Because we might draw a better three to play, even though it's unlikely. Hey, it happened. I'd rather Emergent Sequence, I think. Maybe not. It's going to be close. Okay, so one toughness, but I don't actually want, even want to kill that. Seems like Fractal Summoning. And then um, Sequence or Kelpie Guide is now pretty close. Eh, I think it's still Kelpie Guide. Just use more mana. Well, I can worm next turn either way if I draw a land or two. Like, if I Eureka Moment instead of Kelpie Guide, I need two lands, but I also get two extra cards to do it. Like, if I go Kelpie Guide, I just have one card for one land to bookworm next turn, right? If I go uh, Eureka Moment, I need two lands, but in, like, three cards or something. So it's probably a little harder, but I also have, like, more cards and mana to work with if I don't draw lands to sculpt good turns. Okay, so didn't get the land for bookworm... Uh, so what can we do? We can Fractal Summoning for 5, but that's going to be way bigger later. So it looks like now is a good time to fire that Eureka Moment. Seems better than Perilous Research right now. I don't really even have stuff I'm looking to discard. Play that later. Okay, and now we put like extra lands in play, so pretty easy Emergent Sequence, I assume. And this even turns on Kelpie Guide. Maybe I'll just tap one of their lands. I don't think their creatures do anything. This shouldn't even be legal. Probably shouldn't have gotten them out in there in case they play some kind of sweeper. Though I don't even know if that's going to be possible. I'm, I'm going to tap their uh, campus on their upkeep. This might be the first time I've tapped... Nah, it's not the first time, but it's pretty rare I tap a land with Kelpie Guide. I mean, you know, by the time you're playing that late in the game, normally you're not shutting th much things off by tapping a land. But I've ramped like crazy. This I don't know if they've missed a land drop. I think it was only turn six. Cool. Well, cost myself a game, but not the trophy. Good times. Seven and two. This deck was pretty sweet. I'll give you one last look at it, of course, before I sign off. Hope everybody enjoyed the stream tonight. I know I haven't been streaming a lot lately. Thanks to those of you who still tune in. I really do appreciate it. Uh, like I said, expect some more streams during Dom. Not on the old schedule, but I'll just be popping on, doing two drafts, signing off, popping on, doing three drafts, signing off sporadically because I love Dom. Um... I think this is a really good Strixhaven deck. Um, if you take a look, lots of early ramp to uh, Sequence, to Eureka Moment, and then double Bookworm. The only thing it was really missing was a little bit of removal. Like, I have, like, one Mage Duel, uh, you know, like, 
helix like i don't have much removal i mean i can interact a few other ways like divide by zero kelpie guide prismari command but like i definitely would have really liked to have like you know one more devouring tendrils and one heated debate or something uh i did cast growth not in the games on stream you were watching but i i did kill two people with this by doubling bookworm in the uh previous four wins but i'm not going to tell you that i couldn't have won those games anyway with bookworm i'm not confident that it was right to play growth I, try, I wanted to try it because I normally don't play it in decks like this. I didn't take it over anything playable, obviously. I would not take it over like Mage Duel or Emergent Sequence or something like that in a deck like this. I got it like 10th or something. And then I was just like, eh, double bookworm, charge through. I'm going to ramp, ramp, ramp. Like this is just going to be lethal. Like, you know, if, I, if, I, if that ever comes up, all right. But I'm not sure like this was even correct to play. I'm, I'm confident that if I could change exponential growth into Devouring Tendrils or Mage Duel, you know, just solid removal, I would do it in a heartbeat um, in this deck. Whether it was better or worse than, like, you know, whatever my last card out is, which was pretty bad if you can look. Like, maybe I could have splashed, like, Thrill, which, you know, I have a lot of red sources, but it's not a great splash card. Or played, like, a Servin, because I have a really good late game. But, like, you know, my last card out is not good. All right, thanks to everybody who tuned in. Like I said, I really do appreciate it. I appreciate the support. Thanks to everybody who still subscribed. I totally understand those who didn't, who used to subscribe, but now that I'm stream I've been streaming on average like maybe five, six hours a week for the past few weeks, that's not enough. Fully respect it. Um, but I do really want to thank everybody who tuned in for the support. Really appreciate it. Uh, you know, just follow me. You don't have to, you know, doesn't cost anything, and then you'll know every time I'm on. So thanks again. And now I'm going to read somebody. The only question is who. Thank you, Pedro from Brazil. Really appreciate the support. Yeah, I already lost uh, round one in the sweatsuit anyway, but they were good games. Like, I had a pretty cool deck, black, uh, black blue control deck. I think it was fine. I don't think it was bad. I don't think it was awesome. I drafted it because I opened it, uh, black, um, the mythic, um, whatchamacallit, finale of eternity or whatever like i don't remember if it was number one number two number three in the format clearly complete and total just like banned from limited s tier never saw it so lost a couple of good games uh so anyways i'm gonna raid gg cards if they're still on since they beat me and they're probably in like round three or four if they're still on but i don't know if they are or not let me go check out the bracket Cool. They have this live uh, interactive bracket, and they are not still on. Uh, they lost to Icky in round two, and it looked like Icky and Kirsten's are playing the finals of our pod now. Um, anybody cool still in? You can read Metal Mario. They're waiting on the semis. The only thing is, it might be a little bit of a wait because the other uh, match is still playing. I do like Metal Mario, though. Hey, you're welcome. Thanks for supporting it. I really appreciate it. Um, let's see. So, who should I raid? Anybody got any opinions? Uh, it's certainly open for debate tonight. Metal Mario seems like a reasonable option. They're they're in the top four of the sweatsuit. Well, GG Card's still on. They're out of the sweatsuit, I mean. I was going to raid them if they were still in. Marshall? Yeah, we could raid Marshall. I mean, if the sweatsuit was over, I would snap raid them. Uh, it's just the sweatsuit's going to the top four, and they're, like, just getting started. So I think it makes more sense to uh, raid somebody in the top four of the sweatsuit. So I'm going to raid Metal Mario. Hopefully they're playing some games in between or showing their deck and talking about it, or we'll give some good chats. I mean, I'm going to go. And uh, they're a limited streamer. Like, I like Metal Mario. I don't know them that well, but they stream only limited, I think. Like, drafts all the time, so. Going to give them an, a raid. Uh, let's see. I can drop you a link to the bracket. That's not, that's not a secret. I don't know if I still have it up, though. Okay, um, so yeah, Metal Mario raids. Hey, thanks for resubscribing, Socks. Appreciate the support. And I want to be clear.
clear on something, because I did talk a lot about how I'm not a huge fan of Strixhaven tonight. People, different people enjoy different things. Like, if you're really enjoying Strixhaven, don't think I'm, like, criticizing you or something. This isn't a draft pick, right? Like, it's completely subjective. So, I mean, you know, to each their own, totally. I'm just going to give, you know, my opinion, obviously, because, you know, it's me talking. But I'm not saying, like, there's anything wrong with enjoying Strixhaven or something. Um, okay, so, Metal Mario Raid. Their name's just Metal Mario, right? Yes, it does. That's what I just said, Pedro from Brazil. If you don't like Strixhaven, Strixhaven, you're in the right, like I just got done saying. Everybody who does like Strixhaven, totally in the wrong. Crystal clear. It's objective, not even an opinion. So, you're, we're, you're, uh, you're absolutely correct, Pedro from Brazil. Thanks, Sox. So there's a dash under the name. Didn't know that. You just saved us from ra raiding some random channel. That would have been interesting, though. Or an underscore, not a dash, rather. I wonder if they, their name is Metal Mario because they listen to metal. I mostly listen to pop. I'm kind of the opposite. Need to, like, ra raid them and then spam, like, Taylor Swift or something. Thanks, FB Brule. Appreciate the compliment. Yeah, I mean, Brazil's always been a really strong magic co country, actually. When I think, I mean, I guess it does have a pretty large population, though, on like some of the other hotbeds, like Czech or whatever. That's awesome. Well, I hope y'all are doing all right down in Brazil. I know, uh, I mean, you know, um, COVID's affecting everywhere differently, and we always hear that it was like tough down there. So if there's three Brazilians in the house at the moment, probably a few others not chatting or whatever, but I hope everything's going okay for y'all down there and you're starting to get vaccinated and uh, can get past this thing. Mario Brothers, I definitely respect, of course. I obviously, being 37 years old, the first video games I ever played was literally the original Nintendo when I was like five or six. Mario Brothers. You know, like, literally, if I, I mean, some of you out there know exactly what I'm talking about and some of you out there are like, what on earth are you talking about? If you're like under the age of like 20, 25 or whatever, and you're not like super video game like geek, Google like uh, Nintendo, just like original and look it up or whatever. <laughs> to everybody else out there, enjoy the much better games. We've come a long way from Mario 1 in like 1987 or whatever. Now we get to play Magic the Gathering all day, every day on our computers and the internet. So shout out to the one of the originals. It wasn't actually the first. And... Uh, Good luck, Metal Mario, in the top four. Good luck to everybody else in all of your drafts and so on. And I will see you next stream.